Hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, my name is Derek Snyder, and I'm a meteorologist here at Na the National Weather Service office in Paducah. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for joining us tonight on this uh, Careers in Meteorology webinar. And I think we have a really great lineup uh, of speakers for you tonight to talk about their jobs and, and how they got to where they are today. And, uh, and, and hopefully uh, this will be a very illuminating experience for you to kind of share, shed some light on parts of the meteorology field maybe you didn't know about or hadn't really thought too much about that you might be interested in pursuing as a career. So before we go on, I, I thought I'd share my webcam here so you can actually see me as I present. There we are, hopefully everyone can see me okay. And, All right, I might uh, go ahead and get going here. If anyone has any questions, uh, feel free in your GoToWebinar, uh, feel free to uh, ask a question. There's a box that says questions in the bottom, uh, <clears throat> kind of towards the bottom of the GoToWebinar panel. And you can uh, <clears throat> ask a question in there and uh, we'll try to get to it uh, maybe towards the end of some of our talks. Otherwise, um, We'll, we'll be take, doing a, a longer discussion after everyone speaks, after all of our presenters speak. So um, I'm hoping that uh, you'll find this very useful and, and, and we're very open to any questions or, or comments you might have about a potential career in meteorology. So a little bit of what's on tap for tonight. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit first before we get to our speakers about what, what do we call this? We call it the weather, weather enterprise. Well, what exactly is that? And what does that entail? And I'm gonna try to give a brief overview of that. And then um, I'm very excited. I have four of my colleagues and uh, I'm proud to call them friends uh, talking about their careers in meteorology and how that <clears throat> and what their careers mean to them and how they got to where they are. And then finally, uh, we'll open it up for some Q&A and discussion and, uh, and we can kind of open it up and have everyone uh, <clears throat> share their thoughts about different topics. And, and, and uh, I, have, I have some questions too. To ask everyone so we'll, we'll have a good discussion once everyone presents and um, for timing purposes I'm, we're kind of shooting to be done around 7 30 central time tonight so about 90 minutes uh, all together so a little bit more housekeeping uh, save your presentations or questions till after the ends of the of the presentations we'll try to get to them all then if, if it's a short question maybe we can answer one or two as we go along um, another thing uh, if you if you join us late or if you missed this presentation or you wanna share it with someone, we're recording it and we're gonna upload it to the NWS Paducah YouTube page. And if you have any other questions or comments about this course, uh, my email is uh, derek.snyder at noaa.gov. Uh, feel free to shoot me an email uh, if you have any questions or comments that you'd like to share about this uh, presentation. So, and with that, we'll go ahead and dive in. So I kind of thought like, how am I going to describe the career of meteor, the field of meteorology in terms of a career? So I kind of came to it as this idea of a bar stool, the bar stool of opportunity, not not to be confused with like bar stool sports or anything like that. It's just it's just a generic bar stool. So you have a bar stool and it has four legs on the bar stool. And so and you think of the bar stool as as the weather enterprise. And so each one of the legs has a has a part. And the first part here would be what we call the public sector which is kind of what uh, the weather service is, is part of the, the, the federal government or state government <clears throat> agency funded by taxpayer dollars. And this would also include uh, things like the military as well, which I'll go into uh, a little bit more in depth later. And then on the next uh, part of the bar stool, you'd have, uh, whoops, uh, you'd have uh, the private sector <clears throat> and uh, forecasters that work for companies and provide maybe specialized forecasts for those companies that that help them maximize uh, their goods and services for their consumer and help maximize the profits and keep and, and keep uh, the revenue uh, <clears throat> nice and steady. And then another part of this bar stool would be what I would consider uh, kind of the broad uh, area of academia, which could kind of be combined with public the public sector forecasting side, but it kind of stands out on its own. Uh, you have uh, research uh, at universities and schools. You also have uh, kind of a mix of, of, of uh, what we call cooperative institutes uh, that are funded by maybe the public sector, maybe a little of the private sector, and then academia, they're hosted at schools or other uh, <clears throat> facilities uh, where you have research that come together that help uh, in various in, uh, uh, ways of doing research 
um, <clears throat> to help bring uh, you know needed uh, research to the rest of the weather enterprise to help keep us moving forward. And then last but not least, uh, by any means, you'd have what, uh, the broadcast side. So that would be uh, multimedia on television. Uh, it's becoming more and more broad about the uh, mediums that you transmit or you broadcast to. It's not just on TV anymore. It's uh, social media. Maybe you're doing uh, <clears throat> different kinds of uh, uh, stories outside of weather. Um, there's a lot to it. Uh, it's, it's definitely kind of a, a growing and evolving field too. So uh, so I mentioned it earlier. I'll go through each of the, the parts of this bar stool uh, one by one. You have uh, what I would call the public sector. And so your first thought would be, okay, the National Weather Service. But uh, <clears throat> are you really, do you, do you know what exactly the National Weather Service is? You know, I'm here at our, our local office, and, and for a lot of people, the, 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 the what we call the field offices are are the we're the most public facing side of the of the National Weather Service, but uh, it goes well beyond that. Uh, the Weather Service has a headquarters in Silver Spring, Silver Spring, Maryland, just outside Washington D.C. The Weather Service is divided into six regions, um, and in those regions, we have 122 forecast offices, 21 uh, Weather Service offices, which are kind of smaller, more devolved uh, weather service offices uh, compared to the forecast offices. 21 center weather service units, those provide aviation forecasts for different parts of the, the country. And similarly with the 13 river forecast centers that do high uh, river forecasts for all sorts of um, parts of the country, different kinds of rivers. Uh, you also have tsunami warning centers for the Pacific and the National Tsunami Warning Center, which uh, warns for the Atlantic and some other uh, areas of the country. <clears throat> In addition to that, the Weather Service is also uh, host to what we call national centers, and it's all hosted under this big umbrella called the National Centers for Environmental Prediction, or NSEP. And under those, you have some familiar names you might recognize if you're kind of a, a weather enthusiast, things like the Climate Prediction Center, the Aviation Weather, uh, weather Center, <clears throat> Environmental Modeling Center, uh, the Weather Prediction Center, Ocean Prediction Center, uh, central operations for NSEP, and then we even have things like Space Weather Prediction Center. We that predicts things like uh, solar storms and, and aurora borealis and, and those sorts of things. And then you have uh, some of the more famous uh, uh, <clears throat> centers here: the Storm Prediction Center in Norman, Oklahoma; the National Hurricane Center in uh, Miami, Florida; um, the Meteorological Development Lab; and then one of our newer uh, national centers, the National Water Center, located in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. So. The Weather Service, you know, definitely encompasses much more than just our the, the field offices. It's just we're just one piece of that huge puzzle. And uh, the map is kind of blurry. I apologize, but uh, <clears throat> what you see is kind of a all that plot on the map. Uh, the different forecast offices, the different national centers, the different river forecast centers, and it goes basically from <clears throat> from across the lower 48, Alaska, Hawaii, into uh, into Puerto Rico, all the way into well into the Pacific Ocean, even to places like America, Samoa, in the Southern Hemisphere. So it's really, uh, it's a huge enterprise that, and it takes a lot of people to keep it going. And, um, and all of these places have people that have very important jobs with the Weather Service uh, that helps move our mission forward to uh, protect lives and property. And so, Something else I mentioned it, I alluded to it briefly earlier, was this idea of, of, of forecasting opportunities in the armed forces. And the logo you see here is for the 18th Weather Squadron that's located just down the road here from Paducah at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And uh, we work closely with them and they, uh, they have a very important operation. Uh, they're co-located with the 101st Airborne uh, and uh, they have a very important mission for uh, keeping our armed forces safe in missions all around the world and including what's happening right there on base. So um, if you're if you're a high school student or a college student, <clears throat> um, you know, I, I know people that uh, went through the uh, ROTC program at, at college and they got very rewarding uh, forecasting jobs in the in the military around the armed forces uh, doing it that way. So that's definitely something to consider. Uh, and, and then once you're done with your armed services uh, career, uh, the Weather Service uh, has hired a number of uh, former military uh, <clears throat> uh, people who served in the military. And I think about a third of our workforce is, uh, is former military. So the Weather Service is very, very proud of the number of people who have served our country in the armed forces uh, joining uh, join us once their uh, military careers are over. And 
And then I'll just kind of go to the private sector. I just kind of racked my brain and thought, here are some companies, the bigger bigger companies I can think of that that employ meteorologists. Some of them make, you know, you you've heard of before AccuWeather, the weather company, which is uh used to be uh a part of the, uh, the bigger umbrella over the weather channel, or used to be at least. Uh and then some airlines that sort of work very closely with uh, the National Weather Service, uh, Southwest, they have a forecasting desk. Uh, FedEx works very closely with uh, the forecast offices and their hubs, like especially Memphis. Um, and then DTN provides a lot of uh, road weather forecasts, decision support forecasts for different businesses around the country, especially a lot of sporting events. And then uh, <clears throat> PG and E is Pacific Gas and Electric. It's just one example of a utility company that has meteorologists on staff, but numerous utility companies employ meteorologists around the country uh, to help forecast uh, <clears throat> low demand or severe weather that might impact uh, uh, their power transmission capabilities. And, and one of our speakers in a little bit will be talking a little bit more about that. And then uh, I didn't want to leave this uh, out, but have you, you might even consider wanting to go into business for yourself. And this logo here, um, it's the American Meteorological Society's uh, uh, certified consulting meteorologist logo that you wanted that you have to pay pay dues and take a quiz or take a test to prove that uh, you're qualified. But <clears throat> this is just one way you can go into business for yourself. But this would be kind of a way you sell your meteorological expertise to maybe a lawyer or uh, for a case or something like that, or you might do uh, consulting for different enterprise, different uh, <clears throat> things like a county fair, uh, different uh, outdoor events or something like that. Uh, you you would sell your meteorological services that way, uh, kind of a, a going into business for yourself. And that's another way that you can um, uh, try to uh, make a career in meteorology. So I didn't want to leave this out, but you know, if you're definitely a go-getter, this is something that you might want to Think about considering uh, as a career path forward uh, working for yourself uh, as a consulting meteorologist and then um, I'll, I'll go over this kind of briefly i just kind of put some logos up here um the the cap and uh, the cap and mortarboard that's supposed to represent academia but then there are also things i alluded to earlier different institutions that hire people with higher education degrees uh, master's degrees phds uh, some examples are noaa's uh, cooperative institutes and other uh, places like the uh, U.S. Naval Research Laboratory. And uh, just to give you an idea of what, the, I mentioned the cooperative institutes, um, here's a map of all the cooperative institutes that are located all across the country from Hawaii to the West Coast, to the middle of the country, the Great Lakes, and Northeast and down even into uh, the Miami area. And they all kind of research different things like, uh, uh, for example, SIMS here, and that's located at the University of Oklahoma in uh, Norman. Uh, they they uh, mainly uh, research severe weather and weather operations, <clears throat> but some of these other ones, uh, the one here in Wisconsin, the other SIMS, uh, they do research with satellite meteorology, if you're interested in that. Um, they're one of the premier resource institutions for uh, <clears throat> for interpolating and doing research with satellite data. Some of the one, other ones uh, would be, uh, this one's the Northern Gulf Institute in uh, Mississippi. They do research with the Gulf Coast. And so there's more of a marine uh, oceanography component to it. So there's a lot of different ways that you can uh, you can be involved in different aspects of meteorology that you can be uh, in, in, involved with. And last, lastly, uh, I'll let uh, our camera and our speaker on the broadcast side talk about uh, more about how broadcast works. That's, this is a, a little bit of an area I don't know a whole lot about. You know, I'm, if you've listened to me talk so far, I really don't have the voice or the face <laughs> for television. So uh, uh, the map you see here is a map of, it kind of looks like a kind of a congressional gerrymandered map or something like that you might see. Uh, but it's actually a map of the different TV markets around the area. And the little numbers here, the little red numbers, uh, indicate the uh, rank of the market. There are 200, 210, I believe, of these uh, demographic markets around the country and uh, basically your advertising rates and your pay are dictated by the size of the market you work in and uh, so the, I zoomed in here on the uh, uh, the Paducah area so we're number eight Paducah the Paducah market's number 88 uh, 210 so a little bit above halfway uh, and so you can kind of see St. Louis obviously going to be a bigger market Nashville's a bigger market too and then uh, <clears throat> a lot of uh, meteorologists on TV have these seals of approval uh, from the Amer American Meteorological Society 
or the uh, certified uh, certified broadcast meteorologists or the National Weather Association's uh, seal of approval. And so uh, usually with those those things, you have to take a test and pay dues, and you'll have to take a recertification test every few years uh, to stay in good standing with uh, with those organizations. So. Um, I wanted to go just a little bit beyond, I call it beyond the bar stool. I'll uh, just click through here. Um, if you're have an interest in weather or meteorology as a career, but maybe you don't, you know, the you, there's not a school nearby you, you like, or you don't, you're afraid of some of the classes, the coursework uh, might not be uh, what you uh, thought it would be, or might, you're afraid it might be uh, uh, a little bit too challenging or a little bit too time consuming, um, I'd highly recommend that you consider what I would call these meteorology adjacent careers. So uh, for example, something like IT services, I mean, every weather service forecast office has an IT person who helps us keep things running. We have tons of people at the national headquarters, the regional headquarters that work on IT, the IT side of things to keep things going. Uh, those are um, uh, critical jobs that uh, you don't you know, specifically need a meteorology degree to do, but they help make our lives easier. And you can you know, you know, put that over in the private sector or any other side uh, and uh, it'd be kind of a similar deal. And then you have things like emergency management uh, for the weather service, one of our closest partners that we work with on pretty much almost a daily basis are our local emergency managers, especially when we have severe weather coming our way. Um, we work with them, we'll brief them, we take phone calls from them, we call them when you know something something's changed or something bad's coming. Um, and there's a lot more to it than just weather on the emergency management side, but uh, it's definitely a, a key component of what they do. And uh, we are very close partners in working together. And then you might think of things like uh, agricultural consulting. Um, <clears throat> there are a lot of uh, degree programs out there that offer things in terms of uh, uh, ag management, ag business management, and those sorts of things are very closely integrated with the weather, just the nature of how agriculture works. And that's something, uh, if, if you're in, have an interest in, interest in ag or, or an ag career, but you also have an interest in weather, that's something definitely to keep in mind. <clears throat> and then uh, moving over here, I mentioned something about environmental science. This is kind of a catch-all term for things like maybe water quality or air quality, um, things like um, <clears throat> um, modeling, uh, pollution, that sort of thing. There's a definitely a strong meteorological, meteorological component to that, uh, and they're very closely related, but it's just a different kind of, different side of the same coin. And uh, a big part of meteorology uh, is trying to communicate our forecasts as effectively as we can to the public, and that's where something like social science becomes really important about. And there's a lot of research that happens at, at NOAA and the Weather Service with some social scientists, social science uh, researchers, either in-house or people that we consult with at universities. And we talk very closely to them and try to figure out what's the best way to reach people the most effectively to get them to take action when there's hazardous weather threatening. And then you have um, <clears throat> things like equipment technicians. We have the weather service, every weather service office has multiple electronics technicians that keep our Radars working, they keep our buildings running, they keep our uh, weather stations that report the temperatures, they keep all that stuff going. Um, <clears throat> it's a critical role and you get to work directly you know, in, with the weather service and the weather service and um, we couldn't do our jobs without what they do. And uh, it's definitely, if, you're, if you like working outside, <laughs> there's a lot of outside work for better or for worse. Uh, the weather recently hasn't been here, hasn't been that great for it, but uh, if it's something that is interesting to you, that is something, um, <clears throat> definitely something to consider career-wise. And it's a very rewarding uh, career and very fulfilling to keep all of our uh, equipment up and running uh, in the weather service to help uh, protect lives and property. <clears throat> and then the last few here, uh, geographic information systems. This is kind of a uh, catch-all for things like uh, geography, uh, mapping, um, what we call remote sensing using satellite data to detect um, different phenomena and, and mapping out to, to uh, and spatially analyzing it for you know, anomalies or trends or detecting certain you know, elements or something like that. Uh, there's a lot to it and it's more than just meteorology, but uh, if you, meteorology is built on maps. So it's very critical uh, for us for what we do and 
anyone who works in a, in a GIS career, uh, there's definitely an intersection there between those two things. And finally, these last two, uh, model development, you know, if you're if you're a weather geek like like I was from a young age, you looked at things like weather models online and uh, you you kind of got a feel for how they worked. Well, there's a lot of people that work on these models, both in the weather service and in the private in the public sector and in the private sector. Um, computing has reached a, a point where not just the weather service can afford to have the supercomputers to build models. Private companies now are starting to build these models as well. And then, you know, we have uh, models built here by by the uh, NOAA and the Weather Service that are called the American models. Then you, you might have heard of other models in Europe. There's a European model, there's a Canadian model, there's a model from the UK, there are German models, Japanese models. Um, so there's a lot going on with with this and uh, there's a lot, and if you definitely have a computer science background or a programming background, and this is something that uh, is interesting of interest to you, this is definitely something that you might consider pursuing. And finally, uh, I have this one called risk modeling that kind of goes into the insurance industry. Um, they do a lot of work trying to calculate what's the risk of this event happening in this area. And they use that to determine you know, the rates you pay uh, or preparations that might need to be done, or even just, uh, you know, do, should, can we provide our homeowners, like our policyholders, some sort of incentive to get some sort of, like maybe weatherization done or have their home built in a certain way that makes it more resistant to, you know, hurricane force winds or something like that? Or should, you know, should we encourage local governments to adapt certain building codes? So there's a very close uh, <clears throat> uh, connection there between things like this, uh, the modeling risk, uh, and you know, it's a lot of number crunching and big data and, and those sorts of things, and uh, meteorology. So that's uh, those are just some of the ones that came to my mind. I'm sure there are others I'm forgetting. Um, there's a whole realm of things like you know, science journalism that is kind of almost like going into your business for, for yourself nowadays, but you, know, you have groups like um, the Washington Post has a very popular group called the Capital Weather Gang that does a lot of reporting, original reporting on things like um, uh, the weather service, you know, big weather events around the country or even around the world. And it's um, um, very popular, very widely read. So with that, uh, oh, before I uh, move on, so, I've mentioned some things like the AMS, uh, National Weather Association, and then the American Geophysical Union. These are all professional organizations that not every meteorologist is a part of, but a lot of them are in one way, shape, or form. Um, a, a lot of the, the meteorologists I know are members of the American Meteorological Society and the National Weather Association. If you're a student, they have student uh, memberships that are re relatively affordable for you, uh, if you to get involved with. And this is an endorsement. I don't want to say you got to join these groups. You don't have to. No, this is an endorsement anyway. I'm just letting you know that these are organizations that uh, provide a lot of professional resources, whether it's job boards, uh, mentoring uh, uh, sessions. Uh, they have very popular annual meetings where people present research. Um, they have offered, and uh, you can get involved. They have committees for students. Um, you get a lot of you can get a lot of very useful career advice. I know it's coming handy handy in my career uh, as I've come up uh, from college and eventually through the weather service. So um, these are things to keep in mind if if you hadn't before. I didn't really know about these until I was like eh, pretty late into college, almost too late. So that was one of the motivating things for me to put together this webinar was that I wanted you, I want especially you, you younger students, I want you to be aware of these things. When you have more time to take advantage of them than I did, I always felt like I was one step behind. And just knowing some of these things, and some of the speakers you're going to, going to see here in a few minutes, um, I think that would be. Uh, I, I really hope that this is something that you can find useful and take uh, take with you going forward. So, let's see here. I saw we had a question. Anything on clouds? Um, I don't think we're going to be going. We're going to be going more into the specifics of just the career opportunities. We're not going to get a lot into the like the X's and O's of, of weather forecasting. This is more just an overview of how 
um, uh, of the different career options you might have. So uh, with that, I'd like to introduce our speakers for tonight. Um, uh, they're, they're, I'm really excited that so, see so many uh, that they uh, agreed to speak. Uh, first up, we'll have Ashley Ravenscraft, who uh, used to work with me at the Weather Service in Paducah. She's now back home in Huntsville at the Weather Service office there. Uh, and then after that, we have uh, one of my uh, friends from college, Adam Simskowski, who is an operational forecast planner for the Mid-Continent Independent System Operator. And he'll tell you more about that when he talks. Followed by Dr. Katie Crandall Vigil, who's a research scientist at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, it's uh, set, it's pronounced SIMS, but you know it's it's the Cooperative Institute for Mesoscale and Meteorological Studies, and she also works closely with the National Weather Service Operations Treatment Ground. And then finally, we have uh, Cameron Hoppman, who's the chief meteorologist at WEBB TV in Evansville, Indiana. He's actually doing a show right now, so he'll be joining us a little bit later. So uh, that's why I have him going last, but you know. Definitely not least. So I'm going to go ahead and hand things over to Kate or to uh, Ashley here. Make her present her. Oh. Okay, Derek, can you hear me? Yeah. Can are you sharing your screen yet? I am trying to let's see okay okay i may have to pop off and pop back on uh due to mac preferences with recording my screen so i will be right back hang on just a second okay that's fine <clears throat> While she's doing that, I see there's a couple other questions. Um, someone asked, we'll get anything showing that we took this. Uh, not, uh, I don't have any like certificates or anything uh, ready to go, but if you like something, shoot me an email. I'll have my email here at the end and I can try to get you a certificate or something like that if you like that. Um, someone also asked, where did I go to college? Uh, I went to Purdue University in Indiana and uh, they have a very good atmospheric science program there. Actually, it says you're offline. Are you? Did you have a internet hiccup? Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, good. Um, let's see, I might be able to share my screen now. Okay, I can share, let's see. Okay, I may not be able to share my webcam, but I can, I think I can share my screen. Let's see. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Trying to do this on a Mac is a little bit of a pain. Um, okay, can I share my screen? Derek, you may have to uh, you may have to share the the presentation. I'm it's not giving me the option to share my screen right now. Oh, okay, hold on. Sorry about this, everyone. This is what happens when we have to telework from home. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Can you see my screen, Ashley? Um, no, I cannot. It still says waiting to view Ashley Raven's craft screen. Okay, I can see your webcam. Okay, yeah, I'm trying to get it. So I can, I might have to, let's see here. I might want to make you a presenter. Maybe that'll that'll let you share. Okay. Your screen. Yeah. Let's see. Share my screen. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. Perfect. So I will go ahead and get started here. Um, so like Derek said, my name is Ashley Ravenscraft. Um, I started out. I'll I'll go into a little bit more about um, about me. But I am a forecaster at the National Weather Service in Huntsville. Um, and I'm just going to start off. Derek covered some of this stuff already, so I won't spend too much time on it. Um, but as he said, the Weather Service itself, the field offices, we do have 122 offices that cover the entire country. Um, my office in Huntsville, Alabama, uh, is actually one of the, it is the newest office. Um, we've only been around since uh, I think we officially opened in January of 2003. Um, so a typical forecast office um, basically covers anywhere from 20 to 50 counties. Um, Huntsville is is one of the smaller ones. We only cover 14, um, but we do get a lot of weather that comes through there. So um, just because we're small does not mean that we're not a very active office. Um, so and then that you have some offices that that um, actually uh, split counties. Um, those are more popular out in the western the western areas where you know your your counties are bigger and um you know your your area of responsibility is is bigger um so about the weather forecast offices themselves um so most of the 122 forecast offices are in standalone buildings um like paducas there's a picture of paducas on the uh the top right um and then we have some that are co-located with other federal buildings um, within another, uh, you know, within other agencies. Um, some are located at universities um, and then, you know, some have the radar on site, some have the radar off site. Um, my office in Huntsville is actually located on the University of Alabama in Huntsville's campus. Um, so we share a building with the university, we share a building with NASA, we share a building with other um you know research uh communities um so it's really it creates a really unique op um, opportunity for collaboration um within our office here in huntsville so um as derek said we do have um you know there's we're not just the the national weather service forecast offices we do have um you know other office other forecast centers that are more geared towards um hydrology or aviation um so we have river forecast centers when i worked there in paducah it was unique because we got to we got to work with three different river forecast centers um so we worked with the ohio river forecast center the north central river forecast center and the lower mississippi for uh river forecast center um now when i'm in huntsville now that i'm in huntsville we really only work with the lower mississippi um and we we uh sometimes work with the southeast river uh forecast center but if you're more interested in hydrology, um, you know, this this may be uh, kind of more up your alley uh, when it comes to, you know, looking for potential jobs. Um, so what these do, they provide river and flooding forecasts and warnings um, and basic hydrologic forecasts um, for basically all across the nation. We also have Center Weather Service units. Um, as Derek alluded to earlier, these uh, units are primary focus, primarily focused with aviation. Um, so what they do is, you know, they they provide weather forecasts and advisories to the nation's 21 air route traffic control centers. Um, so, um, you know, they they tailor their forecasts to, you know, thunderstorms, turbulence, um, icing and precipitation, which has definitely been a factor here lately. 
um, across most of the country. Um, so, you know, they, they stay pretty busy there too. Um, Derek also mentioned that we have national and regional offices. Um, so we have a national headquarters that's in uh, Silver Spring, Maryland, uh, in the DC area. Um, and then we have six other regional offices. So um, when I was in Paducah, we belong to the central region. Now that I work in Huntsville, I'm part of southern region. Um, and each region does things a little bit differently. Um, so what they do is they handle more of the administrative um, and operational support centers. Um, they have definitely um, kind of proven their worth now that, you know, we're in this pandemic time. So when it came to, you know, getting supplies and stuff sent out to the office when there were some shortages, um, you know, that's something that's just kind of an example of what the regional offices were there for. Um, and then during, you know, higher impact weather events, um, you know, like a tornado outbreak or, you know, a crippling ice storm or a hurricane, um, the regional offices can actually, um, you know, send people out to help or, you know, um, allocate different resources to to the, uh, the, the line offices in the field. Um, and then, as Derek also mentioned, we have the uh, National Centers for Environmental Prediction. Um, like he said, the Storm Prediction Center falls in with this, um, the Ocean Prediction Center, the Climate Prediction Center, uh, and the National Hurricane Center, and like he said, the space weather. So within the Weather Service umbrella, um, there are a lot of opportunities to get involved, even, you know, whether it's space weather or whether you're interested in hurricanes or specifically severe weather, um, winter weather, anything like that. There are a tons of different um, opportunities um, outside of just the weather forecast offices. Um, so I know this, this slide's a little bit dense. Um, I won't go over all the specific requirements, but just kind of um, you know, how do you, what's the, the weather services requirement as far as an education? Um, over there on the right, you can kind of see what classes that, you know, they require in order to get in. Um, but basically, you need a bachelor's degree in meteorology, atmospheric science, or hydrology. There's a lot of physical science in there. It's a lot of math. Um, you know, you'll be lumped in with a lot of the uh, engineering students. Um, so you basically <clears throat> kind of have to get a math minor. Um, a lot of a lot of colleges and universities as you go to, uh, when you major in meteorology or atmospheric science, you'll end up receiving a math minor, which is 18 semester hours in mathematics. So um, it's kind of funny when, when I started off, when you know I took a couple of math classes in college and I said, okay, you know, this math stuff is not for me. I'm gonna find a major that doesn't involve math. Um, and then I became a meteorologist. So <laughs> um, it doesn't always work out like you think. Um, so there are ways for students to get involved uh, within the National Weather Service. We have um, several different things, uh, one of which is called a Pathways. So Pathways is a paid position for college students. Um, you need to have completed two full academic years of post high school study or a associate's degree. Um, so what you do with the Pathways is you get on the job and formal training um, and it provides you with experience um, and, you know, just general familiarization of what the Weather Service does, um, policies, working with partners, doing forecast opportunities. Um, you know, it's, it's basically what you would call kind of like a, an internship. It's, um, but what it can do, it's very useful if you're in college and you're, you know, finishing your junior or senior year and you know you want to be a part of the Weather Service. It can actually help you get a job. Um, non-competitively um, in some cases where you can just transition straight from a pathways to a paid, uh, you know, full-time weather service employee. Um, we also have other opportunities. Uh, one's called the Holling Scholar. We've had several of those that have come through um, our office uh, in Huntsville. Um, so it provides uh, successful undergraduate applicants um, with awards. So you get some academic assistance with this um, for full years of full-time study. And then you get a 10-week period. Um, it's typically over the summer. Uh, it's a full-time paid, uh, you know, the pay is kind of nice. It's, it's 700 a week, which is pretty good for, for college students. Um, at a NOAA facility during the summer. So um, you can do these at, you know, the weather forecast offices. I mean, I think there are oppor opportunities at, uh, at some of the other places too. Um, and then um, pretty much every office has the opportunity for you to 
be a student volunteer course right now. Things are kind of interrupted with the pandemic that's going on. Um, but those are open to both high school and college students. They're, it's it's unpaid, but it's still you're gaining very valuable um, uh, experience. I was actually a volunteer before I became a uh, an employee for the Weather Service. I volunteered here in Huntsville for about five years, um, and it definitely helped increase my chances of getting hired later on down the line, even though I wasn't paid. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, so one of the questions we get a lot is, okay, I know you're, I know you work at the weather service, but what exactly do you do? Um, so I'll go into a little bit of that more specifically. So a little bit about me. I graduated with a bachelor's in science, um, in atmospheric science from, in science from the university of Alabama in Huntsville in 2015. Um, and then I wasn't really sure. I knew I wanted to work for the weather service at that point, but you know, there wasn't really a lot of opportunities for me and I didn't think that I was gonna be competitive enough without having a master's degree. Um, so I said, okay, I'll just kind of buy my time and, and go to grad school at UAH. Um, so I was, I had every intention of completing my master's degree and then um, one of my bosses at the time came up to me and said, hey, you know, uh, they just sent out this mass bid. There's a bunch of offices that are hiring right now and I really think you'd have a good shot. So why don't you go ahead and apply for it? Um, and I thought I didn't have a chance, uh, even though I knew I, I had done um, some private sector work as an intern when I was in college, um, but I didn't really know uh, how competitive I would be. I basically had heard you had to have a master's degree in order to be hired because the weather service has gotten so competitive lately. Um, so I kind of applied out of spite just to kind of prove uh, <laughs> to kind of prove a point um, and ended up getting hired on there at Paducah. Um, which was was awesome. I was super excited to you know leave college um, and start working uh, in the federal workforce. And then um, my family's back at home, so uh, you know that was kind of my goal was to come back to Huntsville um, and basically you know spend spend the majority of my career in Huntsville. Um, so an opportunity came up there, and I applied to transfer back to Huntsville um, and came back here in the spring of 2019. Um, so a little bit about it, I, a lot of people in our field know from a very young age uh, that they want to go into meteorology, that they want to be a meteorologist when they grow up. Uh, that was not the case for me. I've always been interested in weather, but I actually started uh, college um, as a pre-pharmacy major. And it wasn't until um, the tornado outbreak of uh, April 27th in 2011, where I sat back and I said, you know what? I said, after that, I really want to be a part of something that can help save, um, you know, and protect people's lives. Um, so, you know, I kind of always thought of it as a hobby. I was always interested in, in weather, but I never thought about doing it as a career. Um, so I kind of find that out late. Um, so if you don't really know what you want to do right now, or you're thinking about doing weather, um, you know, there are some people that don't have it all figured out right when they start college or even two years into college. I was, I was two years into college when I figured out that I wanted to be a meteorologist. Um, and now almost 10 years later, um, you know, looking back, I never thought that I would be as involved in some things as I am now. So one of the things that I get to do, uh, you know, not only do I like working the operational side of my job, but we also get to do some research. Um, and one of the things that I've been working on recently is uh, research relating um, what we call the geostationary uh, lightning mapper. Um, it went on on the go 16 satellite so um, what it basically does is it's a satellite that can show us um, basically the density of lightning um, from far away um, and relating what we see on that to the early detection of tornadoes which can help improve lead time um, which in turn hopefully helps save um, a lot of lives so that's something that i'm working on right now um, so what does the National Weather Service meteorologist do? Um, so the National Weather Service mission is to provide weather, water, and climate data uh, and forecasts and warnings for the protection of life and property and the enhancement of the national economy. Um, so we forecast and interpret the weather. We look at model data. Uh, you know, we, we issue the warning. So whenever your phone goes off at three o'clock in the morning, it's us that's waking you up. Sorry about that, but we're trying to save lives. Um, so this includes hurricanes, thunderstorms, tornadoes, we can put out special advisories for storms that have a lot of lightning in them, especially when it comes to recreational areas or over 
you know, boating areas, um, flooding, and as we've seen more recently, winter weather, um, snow and ice, wind chills, things like that. Um, so we can research local weather impacts. That's something that pretty much every office does. We also work with local government officials um, in the public for weather awareness. Like Derek said, we work very closely to the with the Emergency Management Association, um, so or agency. Um, so you know that that includes the you know your your state EMA, uh, your local county EMA, um, and even federal EMA. Um, so kind of the hierarchy of what uh, most of the field offices looks look like. So my boss is what we call a meteorologist in charge. Um, so he kind of oversees everything with the office. He deals with a lot of the administrative stuff, but, you know, also kind of oversees and makes sure everything's running right. Um, you know, and, and some meteorologists in charge, they still do work shift work. They, you know, they're still forecasters. Um, they're still meteorologists. Um, so kind of underneath those, we also have what we call a science and operations officer. This is also a management position. And basically what they do is they help translate um you know the science and uh, you know different research into operations so they oversee a lot of the training um you know make sure we're up to date on the latest technology and training and things like that and then we have a warning coordination meteorologist um that's also a management position they deal with a lot of the more outward facing um you know things like partnerships outreach um you know planning kind of these um integrated teams where you get you know the broadcast the private sector the um you know the the federal government um involved and then you know we collaborate and see what we can do um you know to kind of improve our uh workforce overall um so then underneath that as far as you know when it comes to the forecasters we have lead forecasters these are um, kind of supervisor positions. Um, they're kind of in charge of each shift. We do work shift work in the weather service. Um, so that is one thing to keep in mind uh, when you're thinking about applying. We do work rotating shifts. Um, sometimes it can be a little bit hard on the body, but you know we, we say that everybody kind of goes through it together. Um, we also have a service hydrologist. Um, you know, they kind of deal with the river forecasting, the flooding, things like that. Um, we also have an observation program leader. Um, they deal with a lot of the observations, um, you know, uh, where we have, you know, private citizens that that have um, equipment to um, that kind of tell us things like pressure and temperature and rain and everything like that. So they kind of oversee all the observation equipment and those partners. Um, and then underneath the lead forecasters is we have meteorologists. That's what uh, myself and Derek do, um, you know, and, and we get to do all the fun stuff of, um, you know, just putting together the forecast and, and you know, doing, doing what I wanted to do when I was in college. Um, so another thing is that we have our support staff and we couldn't do what we do. We couldn't function like we do without these people. Um, they are, you know, what we call the heroes of the office. So we have an information technology officer. They're basically in charge of making sure the software um, you know, is running like it should be. Updates are done on time. Uh, they can, you know, we give them some cool projects so we have an idea to kind of make our lives easier. They can do that. Um, we also have electronic system analysts. So that is a supervisor position to basically oversee the equipment. Um, so they keep the radars running. They keep, you know, a lot of the, the other equipment that we work uh, with running. Um, and then underneath them is the electronic technicians, and they basically, you know, they, they do the same thing. They go out there and, you know, if the radar has gone down at three o'clock in the morning and you've got freezing rain going on, you know, they're, they're, they're up there trying to fix it as long as, as long as it's safe to do so. Um, so uh, we definitely owe those guys a lot. Um, and then we have an administrative assistant. So they handle, you know, they, they're important. They handle, you know, our payroll and things like that, all the, all the admin stuff. So. Um, those are very, very important positions. Um, it's not just all about meteorology. Um, you know, they, they're not meteorologists, but they, they contribute just as much as we do uh, to the overall NWS mission. Um, so what does a typical day look like for us? So we do uh, both short and long-term forecasts. Short-term typically deals with the first, you know, three days or so of the forecast, and then the long-term goes through day seven. 
so we look at model data and kind of interpret that um, and then we we write forecast discussions those are done um, you know usually two or three times a day we also issue river and hydro products uh, forecasts, things like that updated stage information we issue climate products um, talking about you know the daily highs and lows and how it relates to you know what the normal values are we do aviation forecasting um, we do those we send out uh, what we call TAFs, um, their terminal aerodrome forecast uh, to our local airports. Those are done at least four times a day. Um, some offices, not every office, does launches weather balloons. Those are typically done, um, you know, at, at 0Z and 12Z. Um, right now, that would be 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. Um, so uh, neither Paducah nor Huntsville launches weather balloons, but uh, offices, nearby offices like Nashville, um, I think St. Louis, maybe, uh, Derek, you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, or, you know, closer to us is Birmingham. Um, they launch weather balloons, which they're really useful, you know, when it comes to things like uh, severe weather or winter weather and things like that. Um, we also provide graphics for our web page, for social media. That's something that, you know, even over the past 10 years, we've been getting more and more involved with. Um, we do weekly briefings to kind of give our partners an update on on the weather. Um, and then we also, you're always training, you know, within your first year or so, the weather service, it's, a, it's very training intensive. Um, but we also, there's always training to be done. Um, and there's also, you know, various projects to work on. Like I mentioned, you know, I'm working on one with Lightning right now. Um, so like I said, we do work rotating shifts. Um, I just got off a string of, of evening shifts. Um, and then starting this week, I'll be working day shifts. And then the next week, I'll start my overnight shifts. Um, so uh, that's something that's definitely something to keep in mind when you're applying. Um, you know, some people handle the, the rotating shift work better than others. Um, so on Impactful Weather Days, this is actually a picture from our office on April 27th, 2011. So on a typical day, um, you know, even outside of pandemic times, you may have two or three people uh, working on the forecast. On this day, uh, I think we had at least 11 or 12 people on the operations floor um, answering phone calls, coordinating with our partners, issuing warnings, you know, the, the regular routine duties still have to be done, um, you know, gathering reports, doing social media, flooding, severe, everything like that. It, it can get pretty hectic. Um, so. You know, we do issue the convective watches and warnings, whether it be severe tornado, we do flood watches and warnings, um, whether it be river flooding or aerial or flash flooding. Uh, we do winter watches and, and warnings, hurricanes, heat and wind chill, airport weather warnings. Um, you know, we'll do numerous briefings and coordination with surrounding offices, um, whether it be with the, the emergency management, um, you know, with providing them information that they need to make decisions on you know whether to pre-treat the roads before winter weather or information that they need to tell the school superintendents about you know potentially closing schools or letting schools get out early um and we also gather reports we can also do interviews there's been times where we've done live interviews with weather nation or the weather channel um so it can it's it definitely makes for a busy day um but you know we kind of work together like one you know well-oiled machine it's kind of like organized mass chaos on those days so we also do a lot of outreach um unfortunately with the pandemic we haven't been able to do too much of that um we've all been having to do that remotely but um in a non-pandemic world um we do a lot of school talks so we'll come out to schools whether it be elementary middle um high school even college um we'll do talks uh, we can go out to sporting events, um, you know, either on site or remotely to provide weather support for that. Concerts, festivals, uh, we'll hold open houses. We do spotter talks mainly in the spring and the fall when, um, you know, your weather gets more active. And then we do many, many more things. So um, there's, you know, each day is kind of different when you walk in. We always say, you know, every day I walk into work, it's going to be something different. We don't really know what we're walking into. But, you know, it, it really does help, um, you know, keep the job, keep the job fun. Um, I, I love what I do. I enjoy going to work every day. Um, you know, some days are definitely a lot more hectic than others, but it's all worth it um, because, you know, the mission is so important to us. Um, 
so as far as current vacancies go, if any of you are looking at, um, you know, applying to get in. So for, you know, your, your entry level meteorologist positions, we do have some of those that are out right now. Um, there's a few in Wichita, Kansas, La Crosse, Rapid City and Miami, all of those close um, on May on uh, March the 4th. There's even one in Fairbanks, Alaska, if you want to broaden your horizons um, and deal with a lot of winter weather. That one closes on March the 2nd. Um, and then the pathways positions, like I mentioned, um, those close on March the 1st. Um, and there's several vacancies for those. Um, so with those, you can do those in your last two years of of college once you've completed or, or you know once you've completed two full years of of an academic study um, you can apply for those so how do i get to those um, you apply for those through usa jobs it's usajobs.gov um, just kind of a, a shortcut is in the search bar you can type in 1340 we're 1340 meteorologists and all of these positions will will pull up um, so with that if you have any questions um, there's my email uh, my twitter handle um, and I'll certainly be be here to, to answer any questions um, after uh, this this session is over. So with that, I'll stop showing my screen, and uh, Derek, you can pass it off to the next presenter. Thank you, Ashley, for that great talk. Um, you might have Ashley, you might have to hand it back to me in terms of uh, make me the presenter again. Okay, I think I did that. Yep, I got it. All right, awesome. And while you were talking, I was I was trying to answer some of the questions that we got in the chat box. So if you have any other uh, questions on that, uh, feel free to send those in. I'll try to answer them and as we go along, and then we'll have the um, Q and A session um, here uh, after everyone's done speaking. So uh, with that, I'll go ahead and move on to our next spinner, uh, speaker, um, who is a, a longtime friend of mine from, from my days at Purdue, Mr. Adam Smikowski. And Adam, I'm gonna right click and make you the presenter and I'll let you share your screen and your microphone. So just hold on a second. Sounds good. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can. All right, excellent. All right, let me... Let me know when that comes through, and I'm going to put this PowerPoint in presentation mode. Okay. Um, before you get started, I just noticed that since we're running a little bit, we're running a little bit behind. For those of you on the video side of things, there's a 90-minute time limit on the on the video recording. Unfortunately, so we might get cut off. But if, if you're watching this on YouTube later on, uh, if you have any other questions, you know, feel free to email me. Uh, at uh, I showed my email at the beginning of the presentation. So I apologize for that. It's just one of those technology things. <laughs> so uh, that's all I have. So Adam, you can go ahead. I, I think okay. you're sharing uh, your uh, presenter slide or sort of the, your main screen. Okay. So you see the, you kind of see the uh, uh, slideshow and everything. Yeah. Right. Okay. Let's, uh, I don't know, giving everything away. Okay. Um, hmm. Let's let's see if I can try to allocate it to ah yes. Okay. How about that? Uh still the same one, <laughs> unfortunately. Okay. Ah, uh, maybe that should work better. There it is. All right, excellent. Okay, sorry about that. But, all right. Okay, well, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Adam Sinkowski, and I'm a uh, operational forecast planner at uh, MISO, and MISO stands for the Mid-Continent Independent System Operator, kind of a mouthful there. I will talk about what we are and what we do here in just a moment, but what I'm going to talk to you about tonight is load and renewable energy forecasting, and then a little bit of weather forecasting as well. Just kind of briefly go over uh, what I do in my job, uh, and I kind of wear a few hats. At, uh, at my job, uh, but uh, mainly focusing on, on load, uh, renewable energy, and then uh, weather forecasting uh, overall. So 
looking at um, looking at MISO, just kind of a brief introduction. Uh, the Mid-Continent Independent System Operator is an independent non-for-profit organization that delivers safe, cost-effective electric power across 15 states and then also the Canadian province of Manitoba. Uh, to the best analogy I have for that is, is we're basically the air traffic controller of the power grid in the state that we uh, that we that we operate in. So uh, we have uh, we have three main offices. Uh, the main office being here in Indianapolis, the Carmel uh, Carmel, Indiana, which is a suburb of Indianapolis. And in that office, we have a control room, uh, which actually uh, is operated 24/7, 365. Um, and we do have folks who are working in there and monitoring the power grid at all times. And so what they're what they're doing is they're making sure that uh, everywhere that needs power is, is getting it, and they're they're checking and making uh, making making sure supply is sufficient to uh, to meet the demand of uh, of power. And that's part of where my job comes in now. Uh, this may sound a little bit familiar to some of you because it's been on the news recently uh, with uh, with what happened in Texas. And uh, I do want to say that yes, MISO is a is the exact same type of company that ERCOT is, except we are just uh, we're a little bit uh, different geographically. Uh, but uh, I'm not going to talk too much about what happened there. Uh, I can field a few questions later on, but for the purpose of today, uh, we're just going to focus on the demand side of forecasting because because what happened in Texas a lot was was very much so on the uh, the issues were more so on the supply side and uh, and long term planning. So uh, we're going to focus more on short term forecasting, which relates more so to Towards, uh, towards weather, so that's what uh, that's what MISO is, and uh, what we're gonna what I want we do want to introduce to you first is load. I've used that word here a couple times. I know Derek mentioned it earlier, but what it fundamentally is is power and electricity demand. Uh, so your lights in your home, your air conditioner, uh, your heating if you don't use gas uh, for to heat your home or your apartment wherever you may live. That is that is what load is, and it's the aggregation of it over a given geographic area, like a city, a county, whatever it may be. And how we measure load is actually in uh, gigawatts. When you get up to a certain kind of spatial area, like you know, like the Midwest, or as we measure it in MISO, um, but there's also megawatts as well, uh, which is uh, which is more um, it's kind of a measure of power. And for, for reference, one megawatt can power about 600 to 800 homes. And then if we, uh, if we kind of talk at scale here, so a gigawatt then is 1,000 megawatts. Uh, so as we start getting up into these scales here, you can imagine that's quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of homes, businesses, buildings uh, that that are requiring power. But this is basically how we measure power is through gigawatts and megawatts. And in terms of MISO's territory, we have three main territories, being the North Region, uh, the Central Region, and then the South Region. Uh, you can see here that the central region is the highest in terms of its regional peak, so it has the most power demand, and that's because it just has the most population. So just pretty simple there. The city of Indianapolis, uh, Detroit, Grand Rapids, Milwaukee, uh, St. Louis are all included, and also Louisville as well are all included. Uh, that uh, that really uh, drives up the uh, the demand numbers in this uh, in this area. Uh, you'll notice that Chicago is not included, uh, my hometown, unfortunately, but that's uh, that's okay. If it was, uh, it would be it would be quite a bit larger because uh, the whole Chicago area is uh, is not included in uh, in MISO. But uh, again, you can think of these numbers um, in terms of population because that's uh, that's really what the, what the power demand and load equates to. Uh, and here are some numbers where in 2011, we saw our, we saw our all-time peak during the summer months. Uh, and we typically see our highest um, highest loads in the summer. Uh, so a lot of people turn on their AC, uh, their AC units and things of that sort. So we get, typically get the most power demand. But more recently, we've definitely seen, especially last week, with all the cold weather that came in, quite a bit of electricity to demand as well in the, uh, in the winter. So one thing I do as well, and I talked about how I forecast, and I'll get into the methodologies that I use to forecast power demand, but one thing I want to talk about too, and as it relates to weather, is MISO has quite a bit of renewable energy uh, that we use to actually fulfill and supply uh, the electric demand on our grid. Uh, so currently we have 246 wind farms, and they're uh, active, uh, actively totaling about uh, 25.5 gigawatts. So that means that at the maximum, if all those wind farms were to blow at the uh, and work at the uh, at, at their maximum, they would produce about that much energy. And roughly, even today, I was looking, uh, our 
our wind uh, was producing, or at least covering, about 28% of our total power demand today. So a pretty significant chunk coming from wind uh, today to, uh, to help meet the, uh, meet the power demand. Uh, solar has been pretty small in MISO uh, over the past few years, but it is expected to grow quite a bit here coming up. So uh, by 2023, in the next couple of years, we're actually going to see uh, about 3.8 gigawatts more of new wind coming online, but then a quite a bit more solar uh, and that's going to be almost 10 gigawatts coming in uh, over the next couple of years. And, and the solar is primarily going to be in the south. So if you think climatologically, there's a lot more sunshine down here uh, than there is up in, up in Minnesota and Iowa and the Midwest. Uh, so uh, a lot of the solar farms that, were, uh, that are being built in our territory by, by the power companies that we serve and we, uh, that, that are part of our market, uh, are going to be uh, are going to be in the south region, whereas currently and what's expected is a majority of our wind is actually in the Midwest and more specifically in Minnesota and Iowa, because climatologically speaking, this is where the wind blows the most and we get the most production uh, from those wind farms. And so here is, uh, and so what I want to talk about is terms of uh, more of my my functions and what we how we forecast at MISO. So I, I mentioned that I, I do cover uh, the the load forecasting and then the renewable uh, renewable forecasting as well. I don't actually forecast. Um, and my, me and my colleagues don't actually forecast for the wind and the solar. We have a vendor that does that. There's actually quite a few uh, companies out there, private companies that uh, hire PhDs, masters, and other folks with meteorology backgrounds to help build models that uh, that, that that forecast uh, renewable energy. It's actually quite a quite an intricate process, a fun and challenging process. But I wanted to mention that because MISO actually contracts a vendor to do that for us. But my primary responsibility is working with them, understanding what they do, and then also uh, making sure their forecasts are good. So I do a lot of analysis around their forecasts, and I field questions from, uh, from folks in MISO regarding what's going on with the renewable forecast, even though I don't produce it myself. But So going back to the load, though, that is something that I do, we do do in-house. Uh, so what we're really concerned with is kind of the near real time, so kind of the next few hours out, up to six hours out, all the way out to day seven. Uh, so that, that includes maintaining the forecasting processes and the applications that we use to generate the forecast. So monitoring, alerting, resolution of software issues that inevitably pop up, uh, which of course are annoying because they always seem to happen overnight. Um, but uh, working with our customers, and by customers I do mean internal customers. Uh, so specifically the folks at MISO who use uh, the forecast that I produce, uh, specifically the load forecast, uh, kind of the downstream process we call it. Um, and so we, we try to produce the most accurate forecast possible. And then also a very important part of that is, is communicating risk and uncertainty in the forecast, especially when, when weather conditions are, are difficult. Uh, so that is a, um, uh, th that's definitely a, definitely a challenge. Um, and then of course we track accuracy and, um, and kind of keep, keep track of all that. So everybody knows what our accuracy is and we have confidence in what we're, uh, what we're doing. So now I'm going to talk a little bit more about the load forecasting process uh, at uh, at MISO and kind of what it what it entails. Um, and this is a little bit of a busy chart here, but I just kind of want to go go over it uh, because load forecasting is fundamentally the way that it works. It does use statistical techniques and that that fancy word you may have heard, the neural network. So we kind of have that uh, that going on. But ultimately, what it is is it just basically it, it's it's pattern recognition done by the computer algorithm. And the pattern recognition is completed by feeding the computer data. Uh, and the data that we feed uh, the, the computer is historical load data. So we have to gather all the historical demand that we have over that map that I showed you earlier uh, and try to figure out historically, you know, basically kind of tally and uh, tabulate, keep in a spreadsheet, uh, what, uh, what that data is. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and once we have that, we also gather historical weather data for the same amount of time. And then also on top of that, we also gather uh, calendar data, which is specifically day type. Because if you think about power demand overall for a given area, a given city, there's gonna be different signatures and different patterns uh, based on the day of the week. So we look at a Wednesday is gonna be different than a Saturday and a Sunday. So calendar variables, even the hour of the day, make a big difference. So once we feed uh, the, uh, 
the computer algorithm, all this data, and we break up the model seasonally. So we have a winter model, we have a summer model. Uh, we give the computer a good chance to perform its, uh, its pattern recognition. And so once, once it's kind of well-trained and it understands how mode behaves based on weather and based on calendar data, then we feed it live data. So we start saying, okay, here's the latest weather forecast uh, for you know the upcoming Wednesday, the upcoming Thursday. Tell us what is the power, uh, what can we expect power demand to be? And that's ultimately what the output of the model is. So the forecast is produced. Um, me and my staff, we can manually adjust it if we see fit. Uh, and there's a couple different reasons why we'll do that, and I'll talk about that briefly. We send it to our internal customers, and then they can provide feedback. But when I talk about the internal customers, those are, there are the guys in the um, basically in the control room who are very concerned about what the upcoming demand is going to be, so that they can help make sure that we have enough supply uh, to meet that demand in the upcoming time period. Now to the good stuff. Uh, in terms of the weather that goes into the load forecasting models, uh, temperature is going to be the most important, specifically dry bulb temperature. We have, um, you know, that that weather variable in particular does ha has quite a bit of uh, a, of um, predictive power, you call it, uh, in terms of how we're going to see uh, what type of levels of power we're going to see, power demand we're going to see, what type of levels of load that we will uh, that, that we'll see for a given upcoming period. And so you can imagine if it's hot in the summer, a lot of people are going to be running their air conditioners, cold in the winter, the heat will be on, uh, and that uh, that makes a big difference. Humidity, as it comes with dew point, is a, uh, is a pretty big factor as well. Uh, so that is an important variable. Uh, we do have wind speed as well. You can think about uh, wind chill and then a little bit of heat index having an impact. Uh, in terms of how people might behave, in terms of them turning off their electricity, turning it on, businesses, offices. Cloud cover makes a big difference. I'll use a simple example, but if we have a day in Louisville, say, where we have one day where it's sunny in Louisville and it's 50 degrees, and then a few days later, it's cloudy in Louisville uh, and it's 50 degrees, you know, you might say, oh, maybe the power demand is gonna be pretty similar. It might be, but one thing that's going to be different is on a cloudy day, people are going to have their lights on in their house. So we're going to have increased power demand. So cloud cover plays a big, big important role uh, in terms of uh, trying to predict how much power we're going to see. Sunshine minutes is kind of a fun variable, which incorporates cloud cover, but it includes the sunrise and sunset time as well. It basically just gives us an idea of how many sunny minutes we'll see in a given hour. Uh, it just helps the model predict and makes it do a little better job. Precipitation being a important as well. Uh, what we saw most recently with the uh, with the big cold wave in the south is with all that heavy snow they recently got last week, a lot of businesses were closed and that meant less power demand at times. So precipitation is an important variable. Looking at this, I'm going to go, cover this briefly, but we have a couple different models that we focus on, both the short term and the long term. And in terms of actually using um, kind of the, the normal weather forecast that you may be accustomed to, the hourly load, the hourly weather forecast that goes out however many days, that's the one that we incorporate into our model that goes out seven days. So that's really where I kind of am able to do my weather forecasting bit of my, of my job, where if I'm looking at the weather forecast and looking at the models, the weather model specifically going out the next few days, I might make some adjustments to this model. Based if I, if I see the weather forecast that the model Models using it doesn't look quite quite as good as it could be. I'll make some adjustments, and that's where I'll do that here. We do have a short-term model as well, which kind of uh, I'll talk about briefly. But what it does is it relies very heavily on um, on more recent data, so not so much you know weather weather data going out further. It's really focusing on the uh, kind of the data that occurred more more recently. Uh, so it is um, it's an interesting type of technique. It's called auto regressive models. Uh, something to write down and maybe look up as it's a pretty interesting statistical technique. And then specifically when we talk about load forecasting errors, um, we do see, you know, the, the, the model that we build to, weather for, uh, to load forecast is really important. Um, so that, that pattern recognition that I talked about, the, the model has to be doing a good job in itself. So if, if it doesn't do a good job, we're going to see consistent errors. Uh, coming out of the model, uh, but uh, one of the more large reasons that we see low forecasting errors is the weather forecast going into the model was not that good. So that makes a large difference, and it it, it can really uh, kind of impact how um, how how we plan. And so there's a lot of emphasis uh, put into the uh, the integrity and the accuracy of uh, of of weather forecasts um, as 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 it relates to load forecasting. 
One thing I do want to talk about and briefly show how much weather matters in terms of load forecasting. So if you look here at the left-hand side of the uh, of the chart, uh, the, the the graph here, the average hourly temperature includes um, both the September 15th day ahead temperature forecast and then what actually transpired. So we saw here basically uh, with uh, with uh, degrees Fahrenheit being on the y-axis and hours being on the x that uh, in uh, the day prior, we were thinking it was gonna be cooler than what actually verified. And because of that, we have a very similar graph here with load being measured on the y-axis, hours again on the x-axis. Because that weather forecast went into our load model, we underpredicted power demand by 7.6 gigawatts that day in 2018. So, and I, of course, like to joke with my colleagues that I wasn't at MISO at this time, so I'm uh, I'm exempt from the uh, from the errors in this uh, in this graph. But it is a uh, it is a good um, uh, a, a good uh, example to show, and you can see how consequential the weather forecast is uh, to. Um, uh, to, to making a good uh, a good load forecast. So I'm going to stop here for just briefly, uh, just so I can uh, get to my next slide because I want to talk to you guys about um, the um, the opportunities in the in the private sector uh, as they uh, as they exist. So let me pull this up here and let me know is that coming through? Yeah, I can see it, Adam. Okay, great. All right, so I only have a few slides here, about six slides, but it's definitely some important information. Um, and so now I'm going to put on my other hack and uh, talk to you as Adam Spikowski, uh, the 2019 American Meteorological Society Board for Private Sector Meteorology Chair. Uh, so in the, the purpose of that board is to primarily help with student outreach, doing uh, uh, doing talks like this on, uh, so that students can understand the, the opportunities that exist in uh, in the private sector. So I already talked to you that I am a load forecaster and renewable energy analyst basically at, uh, at MISO. Prior to joining MISO, I was a operational meteorologist for an energy company uh, doing some similar work, but I was actually forecasting the weather to uh, support uh, uh, electric uh, power trading and natural gas trading uh, desks. Uh, so a little bit different, but another career opportunity that uh, that exists. So uh, looking at the industries that employ meteorologists, uh, we have quite a few. I'm going to kind of go through these briefly. Um, and this is something that Derek talked about a little bit earlier, uh, but I just wanted to help everybody see how many different industries exist out there that end up uh, employing meteorologists. So we have quite a few. I've already talked about energy. Agriculture is a major one as well. Uh, Derek talked briefly about insurance and reinsurance. Uh, they do a lot of modeling and try to understand the probability of severe events in given areas. Uh, we have advanced computing and modeling, even finance um, and all these different industries, aviation being a big one, commercial and retail as well that, uh, that end up employing meteorologists. I'm actually just briefly covering these, uh, but I am going to provide you a, with a website at the end of my chat here that goes into great detail on a lot of the opportunities in these industries and then the coursework that's required to likely have a good good career in uh, in these industries. So if I go over stuff, I'm a little quick. I do apologize, but I do have some uh, some good information for you to review after this. So titles and roles beyond meteorologists. Derek talked about this briefly, and this is a really important point. You don't, even if you get a meteorology degree or you have some meteorology education, you do not have to be a forecaster standalone, especially in the private sector. So the private sector provides opportunities for those with meteorology education just beyond weather forecasting. And I'm gonna kind of list some titles here uh, and kind of show you. We have a group. Basically, you can be an analyst of almost any type, supply chain, crop, business continuity, energy, as, as I kind of am in my role, uh, even in insurance and reinsurance, uh, transportation manager, manufacturing coordinator, quantitative researcher, data scientist, flight dispatcher, commodity trader. Uh, and so all these different roles exist and you know there's a whole wealth of uh, wealth of opportunity but the reason why these opportunities exist specifically for meteorologists is because of the foundational uh education that that is that is provided in a meteorology education not only you're learning how to weather forecast but you're learning mathematics statistics critical thinking skills science in other disciplines and it really helps you succeed in the business world and in the professional world in general 
I want to briefly talk about this because this is in a very, very important part of the private sector specifically. So um, the major role of data science in the private sector, and I think this kind of covers in the research as well. So uh, you need to have a strong foundational understanding of meteorology. Uh, so complete your degree in atmospheric science and meteorology to, to kind of come into the private sector. But on top of that, uh, have a statistical education and foundation. Uh, this is likely the most important discipline to learn along with your core degree. The common language between you and your non-meteorology coworkers is going to be statistics. Uh, and it's a powerful tool to connect the weather data, uh, both historical and forecast, to the business. Uh, strong programming skills, and this allows you to execute your statistical knowledge effectively. So while these may be two separate bullet points, they are one and the same effectively because you know, you're going to learn statistics, but you're going to learn it through programming. And I think that's the path forward, really. And that's it's the best way to do it. Uh, and it really, uh, really helps you out. But you'll be able to execute your statistical skills uh, by, uh, by by doing some programming. So uh, foundational knowledge of data structures is uh, is very important. So uh, looking about even the most simplistic is just spreadsheets, uh, columns and rows. That, that's going to take you a long way. Efficient programming techniques. And then some specific languages to look into as well. Python and R are both open source, meaning they're free, and they're great places to begin. And Excel is always useful. So I, I recommend learning that. And uh, still, a lot of the private sector uses that. And then, of course, uh, foundational understanding of machine learning. Uh, this is not needed for every private sector role. This is more uh, for uh, some of the roles, but it helps overall. And I know maybe some of you are young. You're still in high school. This may be a big word. Uh, and a big concept, but you do have time. I recommend just looking at it when you can, Google it, uh, find some articles out there and uh, trying to get comfortable with it over time. And the same thing even for your college kids. Uh, it, it, it takes time, and uh, but you have time to learn it and to get comfortable with it too. So um, this is basically, and to tie this back to what I talked about, machine learning is what we do to forecast the load. That pattern recognition that I talked about through the computer is ultimately uh, what that is. Communication is key. Regardless of where you are, what industry you're in, you're going to want to be able to communicate effectively. And this is something I've had to work on throughout uh, throughout my years, uh, in, in both from college all the way to today, um, including practicing for this presentation before I'm speaking to you today. So start and keep practicing now and forever. So always always work on your communication skills, both oral and written. So, and then this, this brief uh, paragraph here, so the best project plan presentation for research will, will fail if it's not effectively communicated. Information must be shared to the knowledge level of your audience in any future role. Odds are that it will require frequent client and co uh, colleague interaction. The skill of translating complex knowledge into simple terms will be necessary for success. And then I want to add this is data visualization is communication. You know, it, we are certainly in the age of the internet now. Uh, everybody has a computer or phone. You know how to use it. You're looking at memes. You're looking at everything else on your phone. You're looking at visualizations. Uh, so by using programming and Excel, Excel, Excel skills to generate nice charts and graphs, you're helping yourself and under, uh, under, uh, others understand your intended message. You know, show your data graphically and in a chart. To help so you don't have to talk so much you don't have to write as much text you help break up the monotony of endless text and of course as, as, as it always is a picture is worth a thousand words so this is something that goes very well with statistical education and also with um uh just just with programming in general so you'll be able to leverage that very well uh, so thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Uh, I do want to give you this. So please visit the American Meteorological Society webpage for more information on employment in the private sector. I need you to, if you want to, Google American Meteorological Society private sector. This will be the first result, and this is the link that you'll find. So a lot of the material I covered in the second presentation will be available there for you uh, to leverage and, and look at and study. So thanks again, everybody. Thank you so much, Adam, for that great presentation. Um, could you go ahead and make me the presenter again? Just uh, right click on my name and it should say make presenter. Okay, I, let's see here. Just stop showing my screen. I don't see you as on there anymore. I, I do I'm see that. US Huntsville, I guess that's, ah, that's my. Okay, opinion. there you go. Excellent. All right, I think. All right, I think we're good there. 
And uh, moving on next to our next speaker, we have Dr. Katie Crandall Vigil, uh, from, who's a research scientist at the University of Oklahoma, uh, SIMS. And so Katie, I'll make you our next presenter and uh, I'll let you take it away. Okay, great. Hold on just a second. All right, Katie, you're presenting. Okay. One more one time, looking through all this. <laughs> yeah, you should have an option to show your screen. It should there's like a big yeah, play button. Right. Okay, show. Okay, there we go. Okay. Uh, I have to approve it really quickly. Okay. I need to improve it. Yeah, uh, let's see. Can you see it now or not? Hold on. I can see your face. Um, okay. you might try sharing your screen again. Yeah, webcam. Yeah, I might have to turn it off. Maybe you won't let me do it at the same time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's a bummer. Hmm. Yeah, it's not letting me do this for some reason. Oh no. Um, huh, um, do you wanna change back to, uh, do it back to you and try it again? I have no idea why it's- Yeah, you can hand it off to me. me any... Or if you just wanna yeah. talk through the slides, that's fine too. It's not a huge deal. Okay, um, yeah, I can go ahead and talk. Uh, just since everyone's kind of short on time, I'll just talk a little bit about um, what I do. So uh, my presentation was kind of on academics. Uh, basically, let me show my webcam. You can actually see me talking while I go through this. Uh, so basically talking about uh, basically academia for uh, meteorology careers. And, and most people are aware of uh, being a professor um, and kind of that route for academia, but um, I'm in a little different situation. I actually work for a cooperative institute. It's uh, the Cooperative Institute for Mesoscale Meteorological Studies, and I actually worked with Derek um, for about almost three years before he uh, joined the National Weather Service um, in Paducah. So, um, so my route was a little different. I uh, got my bachelor's degree in meteorology for Metropolitan State College of Denver. I'm originally from Colorado. And then I traveled to uh, Missouri where I got my master's and PhD in atmospheric science from the University of Missouri. While I was finishing up my PhD, I actually started with uh, SIMS. And um, I'm actually stationed at the National Service Operations Proving Ground in Kansas City. And uh, what we do at the Operations Proving Ground is basically new technology, um, new forecasting processes, uh, things like that. Um, we're some of the first people to uh, do to do testing on that uh, that technology. Um, often they'll test new things at some of the other test beds in NOAA. Um, the Hazardous Weather Test Bed, um, the Aviation Weather Test Bed, and once that technology has been proven and they think it's ready to go out to the field, it'll go to the operations proving ground last. We're kind of considered a last mile test bed. 
and we'll go through and make sure that technology um, is going to be uh, stable, that the forecasters um, are wanting to use that technology, it's going to actually improve their forecasts, and that it's ready to go out to the field, and then we can give management our review, and then it can move forward. And then we also have um, times where we do these proof of concept um, experiments where we're trying to look at how we can change up the forecast process, how we can improve forecasting in the weather forecast offices. Uh, so I'm kind of an interesting um, meld between academia and operations. So even though I uh, work and I'm stationed at the Weather, the National Service Operations Crew and Ground, I am a SIMS employee through the Cooperative Institute. And then basically the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which is the parent organization for the National Weather Service, uh, they will pay the University of Oklahoma and the University of Oklahoma pays me through the contract. Um, the reason this is often done while we have cooperative institutes in the Weather Service and through NOAA is that um, there's a limit on how many federal positions there are uh, throughout the agency, but there's still a lot more work that needs to be done. This is the way that um, NOAA and the National Weather Service can hire researchers to be able to do a lot of this work uh, when they can't necessarily hi hire other federal uh, workforce. So, um, so there's a lot of different routes for academia. As I said, if you're really interested in being a professor, um, most likely you'll have to go and get a doctorate in atmospheric science if you want to be a meteorological professor. Um, sometimes you can be an adjunct professor with just a master's degree. Um, it's less common though. So, um, but uh, you can also then choose to what routes you want to go in academia. You could either be mainly a uh, just a researcher where all you do is research and you don't really teach courses, there's that route. There's others where you might just only want to be a, a, a teaching professor and not do research. And you could go teach at an undergraduate only school and not necessarily do much research. And then you can end up something like what I do is where I work for this cooperative institute, mainly doing research and working with operations. Um, so there's a lot of different paths uh, for academia. Um, as I said, it's, you know, it's usually a longer term commitment because you are usually going for your doctorate. Um, but the cooperative institutes also hire people with master's degrees, so you don't actually have to go all the way to a PhD, you can stop at the master's degree and still do research. Um, so the cooperative institute for Mesoscale Meteorological Studies, it's located in Norman, Oklahoma, even though I'm here in Kansas City, most SIMS work in Oklahoma at, Nor at Norman building at the National Weather Center. Uh, they um, are also co-located co with the National St Severe Storms Laboratory. Uh, the Storm Prediction Center, and um, the Norman Weather Forecast Office. So lots of neat research goes on down there. Um, you know, even though I'm mainly in operations down there, they do a lot of research on severe storms, into societal impacts, um, how to improve forecast operations. There's a lot of different things that people do at SIMS. So if you're really interested in research, and you're like, that's what I want to do, I want to be a researcher, a cooperative institute, it's a great place to think about going. Um, as I said, you can maybe, you don't even have to necessarily do a PhD, you can stop at a master's degree and still be able to do research, still be able to contribute to science. Um, so uh, it's kind of a different path that you can choose. Um, but I think what you're kind of hearing with all these different presentations is there's so many different opportunities in meteorology. Um, it's not just, you know, you're not just stuck to one area. And um, there's lots of different things you can consider. So. Okay, um, I think what I'll do is I'll go ahead and pass it back to Derek, and then we can always ask any questions you have after everyone has wrapped up. So. Yeah, thank you so much, Katie. I know you have to get going here in a minute. So uh, if you have any uh, other comments or questions for Katie, feel free to reach out to me. Or uh, Katie, do you want to give them your email address if you're okay with sharing? If not, I can just I, I can pass along anything people send to me. Yeah, um, my my email address is Katie, K-A-T-I-E dot Crandall, C-R-A-N-D-A-L-L at NOAA.gov. Um, yeah, feel free if you want to reach out, any questions you have, um, if you're interested, especially in going into academia or any type of uh, research um, field in meteorology. So. Awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, while she's wrapping up, I'll just say I figured out how to keep recording. So anyone watching on YouTube, this goes all the way to the end now. It's just it'll have to be broken up into two parts. So we got good news there. <laughs> all right. Thanks again, Katie. Can you can you make me the presenter? Mm -hmm. All right.
All right, thank you so much. All right, and last but certainly not uh, least here, we have Mr. Cameron Hopman, who is the Chief Meteorologist at WEVV TV at, in Evansville, Indiana. And Cameron, just hold on just a second. I'll make you uh, let's see here. Well, Cameron, it's not letting me un, uh, make you a presenter for some reason. I'm not sure oh, no. what that's all about. Let me, uh, I can, I got you unmuted though, so you can at least. Okay. Speak. Uh, let me give me one second. Let me see if I can get you to. Uh, yeah, it's not letting me make you a presenter for some reason. I don't know what the deal is there. Shoot. Okay. Well, uh, we can go fully without vis visuals if you guys would please. Yeah, just in the interest of time, I know uh, yeah. we were kind of running long a little bit, and I'll just I'll put your 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 pretty picture up here so everyone can see it. <laughs> That's a good looking picture. Yeah. Um. Okay. Then I'll just get started here. Um. My name is uh, Cameron Hobbin. I'm the chief meteorologist at WEVV TV in Evansville, as Derek said. Um. And uh, that's I'm kind of an amalgamation of a lot of. Uh, these careers you already heard about, except the only difference is, is that I'm the mouthpiece for everyone. So I kind of happen to take in all of the information that each one of these scientists uh, kind of shoot out and put together, and I ingest that and try to turn it into something that folks at home um, can really uh, just get the basic what they need to know uh, out of it, or at least that's kind of what the career has turned into uh, as of late. I uh, So as the chief meteorologist, um, I'm also a manager. So I manage a team here. Uh, we have myself, my morning meteorologist, weekend meteorologist. We have a couple other meteorologists that we use. So it's a team of uh, five people uh, that I manage on a day-to-day -day basis who um, fill the holes that we need to do. Uh, if we have any really crazy weather like we've had over the last week uh, here in the Tri-State, we had an ice storm about a week and a half ago, two rounds of snow. Uh, coming up to about a total of seven inches for us here in Evansville. Other spots have up to 10 plus inches of snow, which is quite a bit uh, here in the Ohio Valley. Um, we have meteorologists uh, that will go out in the field and really just cover uh, everything that's happening. So I, I manage that team. And on top of all, we really are working to communicate and alert uh, the public as best as we can, again, by using the tools that all the other meteorologists, uh, whether it's privates or public, uh, can feed us information and better communicate that uh, to our viewers at home. So what does my normal day look like? Um, well, I wake up in the morning. The first thing I do when I wake up, as long as my 10 month old is still sleeping, uh, I'm checking the models. I'm seeing exactly that everything that I had talked about the previous day is still holding true, making sure there's no real significant crazy changes uh, in the forecast that day. I'm, I'm reading National Weather Service uh, forecast discussions, again, making sure that everything uh, looks just as right. Our meteorologists here at our station uh, also have a, a nice email chain that goes out to everyone saying okay hey here's what's going to happen day to day moving forward making sure i'm reading that to making sure again that all plays through uh, from there i'm checking social media i'm seeing what other meteorologists uh, around the midwest are saying maybe there's a big system headed our way that's currently in iowa i'm seeing kind of okay let's see what some of these mets are saying out in iowa so i'm trying to take in that information as well uh, all and that's all before I'm getting uh, into the station. So once I get to the station, uh, it's all about putting your forecast together. And that just is a essentially I'm coming in, I'm checking model data. I'm kind of redoing everything, all those steps that I had throughout the morning. So I'm checking all the model data, multiple models, figuring out exactly putting that forecast together. Um, in trying to put together a finished forecast, and most importantly, when it comes to broadcasting, uh, whereas uh, National Weather Service puts out the data and their forecast discussions, I really have to focus in on what the weather story is so I can best present it to our viewers uh, and as clearly as possible. So uh, today's weather story, because we dealt with so much snow, 
over the last week. Today, uh, we're talking warmer weather. So it's going to be near 60 degrees tomorrow here in the tri-state. And that's uh, allowing for all of this melting to occur. So it's going to be a little bit sludgy, a little bit muddy. But overall, it's going to be warm. So we need to drive home the idea that that is what's most important to the folks. And again, we need to focus on our viewers. What affects them the most? Well, it's not going to be raining. That's primarily the most impactful weather. And that's what we're focused on. We're focused on impact to our viewers. We're focused on impact to the folks uh, at home. So impactful weather, we start with precip first, and then we work our way down. So no precip, what's impactful? Well, it's actually going to be warmer tomorrow. So we build our forecast based upon that idea, that weather story. And essentially, we just try to create um, a narrative, much like uh, you, you watch the local news at night. We have a reporter that's covering uh, some sort of story from the community. We're trying to do the same thing. We get as much data, as much information as we can for the next 24 to 72 to however many hours out we need to talk about and try to crunch that into a narrative that folks at home can easily follow. Uh, so we communicate that forecast. We try to best time management that is possible because we have producers breathing down our neck to uh, get us under a certain amount of time. I will be the first to admit that I don't necessarily uh, fall under the time as much as I should to much to my producer chagrin, but uh, at the same time, we try to fit in that forecast as quickly as possible, and again, as succinctly as possible uh, for the folks at home. Um, so that's, again, that's kind of what we do as far as the nightly uh, situation goes. We also are constantly updating social media as much as we can. We're writing uh, stories on our website, again, forecast discussions, um, for our viewers at home. Now, when it comes to severe weather, that's a whole different animal. Um, our forecast is already done most of those times. We forecast, we know the exact timeline, we are just monitoring that radar uh, from that point. So if you're ever at home and uh, the local meteorologist comes on and interrupts their favorite uh, uh, show or broadcast, we apologize. Uh, we are just doing our best to keep folks at home uh, safe. Um, and uh, unfortunately, sometimes that gets in the way of uh, Mask Singer and whatever other uh, show you're watching that evening. So apologies for that. But uh, nonetheless, we're more focused on um, less of what's happening in your uh, favorite sitcom and more what's happening around the area trying to keep folks at home safe, trying to zoom in as close on that radar, getting neighborhoods, getting down to the local level. We're going street by street. If it's, it's a severe thunderstorm warning, tornado warning, we want to be detailed, um, as detailed as possible uh, in those situations. So when it comes to severe weather, um, severe thunderstorms will hop on for 30 seconds to a minute. If it's a more significant storm, a little bit longer, tornadoes, uh, a lot of stations tend to be wall-to-wall -wall coverage. So from the second that warning is issued by the National Weather Service, we're on until that warning is canceled. And that makes some for some long nights sometimes. I've been on uh, air for as long as four and a half to five hours straight uh, with severe weather coverage. So that can make for some pretty uh, crazy uh, broadcasting and some pretty long nights, um, but nonetheless, um, it's uh, it, it can be uh, exhilarating, it can be exciting, but at the same time, you need to be more focused on again, how is this affecting the folks at home? Who's the most in danger in the situation? You need to try to get that information out as uh, uncomplicated and as simple as possible, so they can take the steps they need to do to keep safe uh, in that situation. Um, so that is essentially my position here at WEVV, uh, but as far as um, background goes, how I got to this point, I, I didn't actually set out wanting to be a broadcast meteorologist. I kind of happened into the career. I, I graduated high school um, in Chicagoland uh, back in 2006, and I um, wanted to be a high school teacher, actually. I'm, all of my uh, family, at least on my dad's side, are all teachers. They're, they've been teachers. They're going to continue to be teachers. I'm the one uh, that stepped outside uh, of that. And I wanted to actually go and be a teacher. Uh, when I graduated high school, there was a really big uh, teaching bubble in the state of Illinois that had just popped, unfortunately. So all the freshmen going in uh, to college uh, in 2006 um, were all pretty much told to get out of the teaching um business while you still can because there's not going to be a job for you when you graduate. So I was kind of left wondering what to do. Um, and I was taking my gen eds at Eastern Illinois University and weather and climate uh, popped up. 
And that's something that uh, I was actually quite afraid of as a kid. I, I was terrified of storms. Anytime there was a severe thunderstorm warning or tornado warning, uh, God forbid, it was something that really, really frightened me. And, well, yeah, obviously, you grow out of those fears um, a little bit later on, you know, in the grade school, high school, stuff like that. You're growing out of those fears. But the uh, fascination with the science uh, certainly stuck around for me. Um, and that's something that uh, really piqued my interest when I was taking gen eds. I took that weather and climate class, and that really um, broadened my horizons into the um, meteorology uh, science as a whole. And I just fell in love with the science. Now, I was lucky uh, because at Eastern Illinois University, not only do they have a great program there uh, for uh, just the whole meteorology um, uh, endeavor, but also they have a WEIU, which is a PBS station that's run on campus that runs a nightly 30 minute newscast. Um, and the only person that works on that newscast that is not a student uh, is the news director, that's faculty. Everyone else, so uh, photographers, anchors, uh, producers, directors, everybody behind the camera and in front of the camera uh, are students. And that was something I got involved with after um, starting to get into the whole weather and climate meteorology. Uh, business was that I started working actually on air as a student. So I was on air in front of the camera as early as my junior year of college. Um, and that's kind of where I really dipped my feet into the broadcasting business to begin with. Um, while I was working at WAIU um, nightly, uh, I was still continuing my education, getting my degree, graduated in 2010, and landed my first job at uh, WLFI TV uh, up in. Uh, West Lafayette, Indiana, started mornings. And mornings is a bit of a different animal. When you broadcast, you have to, again, know exactly what your viewers need. In the morning, it's a lot different than in the evening. So when I was working mornings, I'd wake up two o'clock in the morning, go into the station, get my forecast done, all put together, be on air and ready to go at 5 a.m. Um, and folks getting ready in the morning, they don't need to know what's gonna be happening tomorrow. They need to know what's happening right now and over the next few hours and what's gonna happen at lunchtime. And what about when my kids go to school? What about when my kids come home? What about on my drive home? You need to really hit those times. Um, and it's gotta be real quick and real simple um, and constant too. Um, if you watch local uh, news, uh, you'll watch in the morning, you'll see that a lot of these folks are broadcasting and dropping uh, weather on the tens, you know, every 10 minutes or more. Uh, you tend to see hits, little 30 seconds hits. This is what's happening right now. Here's what's going to happen the rest of the morning. Here's what to expect in the afternoon. Um, with the evening, it's a little bit of a different situation. Again, you're broadcasting for what folks need to know at 5, 6, 9, and 10. They want to know what's going to happen the rest of the evening, or what's going to happen tomorrow morning uh, and the next day. So you really need to focus, again, on what's important to your viewers at home. You need to know uh, what's important to your viewers at home. So from uh, WLFI's morning shift, I actually got promoted to their chief meteorologist, which landed me here uh, about five years later. I started here at WEVV in Evansville uh, back in 2018. I've been here since, and it's, uh, it's been wonderful. It's a great uh, community and a great uh, job. I'm, I'm very lucky to be a broadcaster. I love coming to work every single day and having fun and enjoying myself on the days when you can have fun and enjoy yourself. And then obviously there are the days that you need to be a bit more serious, a bit more um, uh, intense might not be the right word, but just more focused on exactly what's happening at hand. Um, Derek also wanted me to talk a little bit about advice uh, for college and advice for getting into the career and everything like that. And as far as advice goes, what I would do is, uh, I, again, I went to Eastern Illinois University, wanted to be a teacher. I happened into, I was lucky that they had a great PBS station that was a nightly newscast. Not many schools have live nightly newscasts. Some of them, um, Purdue University has a weekly recorded newscast. That's a great product up at Purdue. I know Ball State University in uh, Muncie, Indiana, has, um, I believe, three live newscasts. We had a nightly live newscast at Eastern. Um, and that was really something lucky that I fell into. But if you want and you're planning to go to school uh, for broadcast meteorology, find that right school to do so. Do your research, find out exactly what you want uh, out of that school, and you can exactly uh, know exactly uh, where to go with uh, 
that career. So do your research, find out, find the right school and get as much on air experience as you can in school, because that is invaluable. You can learn the science and you can read about broadcasting and practice it makes practice actually makes perfect. Um, that's the best advice I can give anybody who's getting into this is get as much on air um, experience as you can. That includes internships. I know a lot of uh, Mets um, uh, run internships where a lot of students will be crunching data, they'll be putting shows together, but they're not actually getting that much in front of the camera experience. And that's something anytime I have an intern, I really want them, I try to run a boot camp. I try to get them in front of the camera as much as humanly possible so they can get experience in front of the camera before they graduate. Um, as far as career goes, um, never stop learning. Never stop wanting to learn. Learning new ways of broadcasting. Um, try to find um, new and different ways of communicating the same thing. Uh, that's a, especially true for folks who are broadcasting in the mornings because you're going to say the same six hours worth of forecasting. Um, probably 30 or 40 times on a given morning. So communicating that same story 30 or 40 different times can get real stale real quick. So you have to find a bunch of different ways to communicate the same thing and keep it fresh and keep it relatable to folks at home. Um, but always be willing to make changes as well. Never get um, stuck in doing anything. Uh, just that's the way we do it. Always be willing to learn new ways of broadcasting and new ways of communicating. And again, that's what it comes down to. Um, and never be afraid of constructive criticism. Um, never be afraid of someone telling you, you know, I don't really like that when you do that because that's okay. It's all right that they don't like that. It's all right that your boss or your um, uh, someone at home um, who is being polite about something, a lot of people can be pretty uh, pretty mean when it comes to social media, but that's just something that comes with the territory, unfortunately. Um, but be willing to take constructive criticism um, and work with it and learn from it um, because that's going to help you uh, in your career. But as far as um, that goes, it's, it's a wonderful uh, career. I love it. I absolutely love coming to work every single day and getting to interact with the folks I work with. They're wonderful coworkers. It's a lot of fun. And anytime you see folks on air laughing and having a good time, in my experience, it's all very um, genuine. And uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful career to have um, as far as meteorology goes. Thank you so much, Cameron, for that great explanation of your career. Uh, <laughs> I wish you could see you do it, but I, you know, I know, so do I. That's on, that's on my end, so I apologize for that. Uh, uh, while uh, I, I we had a, a question for Cameron, I wanted to ask him, and yep. while uh, he's answering that, if you have any other questions, uh, I believe uh, Ashley and Adam are still hanging around with us too. Uh, if you have any other questions you'd like us to answer, feel free to enter them into the question uh, chat room here, and I'll try to go around and, and get some answers. Uh, if we can. But uh, Cameron, the question I had to you is from uh, Bill Etheridge, who uh, is actually enrolled at the uh, online broadcast meteorology program at Mississippi State. He oh, asked uh, if there is, uh, besides the on-air meteorologists, are there other meteorologists who work behind the scenes or in the field? Yeah, so um, there's a ton of, if you get into broadcasting, there are a ton of different jobs. You can be the on-air guy. Uh, that's in front of the green screen and pointing at all the wonderful graphics that you've made up. Or um, there's also weather producers who are essentially just that. Uh, you're putting together um, in a lot of larger uh, market sizes. There are folks who go to work. They put together um, a, a show for a meteorologist um, that might be a bit more seasoned who might say, I don't really want to put that together. No, I'm, I'm, I'm half joking about that, but um, you can be a weather producer. Um, they essentially will go in, they'll do the forecast. They do everything that I talked about uh, outside of actually getting in front of the camera and on air. Um, also, you'll see the, the poor folks out and about, um, either on local news or on the weather channel who are out in the elements, um, actually talking about being there experiencing it. Those are all meteorologists too most of the time. Sometimes they're just local news reporters, but uh, in our case, um, 
we try to get our meteorologists out in the field as much as possible, including me. I love being out in the field. I love doing my forecast live from a local event when events were still a thing. Um, uh, so uh, those are just a couple of different uh, ways you can get into broadcasting, still be a meteorologist, and still really um, uh, use that expertise and use that scientific background uh, in addition uh, to just being the guy in front of the green screen. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. We had another question for you, Cameron, uh, yeah. from Peyton, who is a sophomore at OU, uh, oh, awesome. who says, uh, what's the biggest piece of advice you would give to an aspiring broadcast med? And uh, they are a sophomore at OU, and they have a live show every weekday that they're involved with. Awesome. That's fantastic. And honestly, um, that would be the, the greatest piece of advice is you have a nightly newscast, a nightly show that you're a part of. Um, get as much on-air experience as you can before you leave school. Because there's a lot of times um, when I know uh, when I was up at WLFI, Purdue has a great meteorology program. Their broadcasting program at that time, I believe it's gotten significantly better in recent years. But at that time, their broadcast program wasn't the best, um, uh, not to speak ill of Purdue University, obviously. I'm not doing that. But just their broadcast program at that time had a, a weekly recorded uh, newscast that did air, uh, students put it all together and everything like that, um, but the meteorologist uh, in training there uh, would have to record their weather on Thursday for a Saturday broadcast, I believe. And that was that made it difficult on them. They, they didn't feel like they could, um, a lot of times, put together their best uh, forecast uh, in that situation. They could when they were only doing it once a week. So when I would get interns from Purdue, I would get them in front of the camera, get as much work as possible. I'd have them putting together their own shows on our WSI um, system to get that experience while you can. So yes, you're at OU, you're getting as much of that experience. From there, what I would do, summer internships, and try to find a internship that will get you in front of the camera. Try to find those internships that will actually give you experience that are just as valuable um, in in person than on paper. Um, I know a lot of folks that uh, have internships that are wonderful on paper, um, but a lot of times you, you end up getting the coffee or you end up crunching some data for uh, a slide that the chief met wants to use. There's nothing wrong with that. Those are valuable as well, and you're learning a lot of information. You're able to pick brains when you're in those situations. But the more on-air experience, the more experience you can get in front of the camera, um, the better off you're going to be. Repetition, repetition, repetition. Do it as much as you humanly can. Um, because that is, it's that practice, it's, it's cliche to say it, but practice makes perfect. The more work you can get done before you graduate, you're going to come off as a far more polished candidate for a job um, coming out of college than other kids will. Yeah, that's a great answer. And, and, and I can, and as someone, Cameron and I are, we both graduated or we're both nearly the same age and I was at Purdue about the time he was talking about and it had the the Purdue meteorology at least for broadcast has definitely gotten better but yeah when I was there it was a little sparse <laughs> uh, yeah. it, was it was definitely the school you went to when you wanted to go to graduate school and, and do research and stuff like that yeah. but you know, the, the, they've hired a lot of great new faculty there that have really made that a focus thankfully oh no um, absolutely and, and there's been plenty of wonderful broadcasters that have come out of there uh, Cam Harden um, uh, meteorologist, he works uh, weekends in Cincinnati. Um, uh, one of my old interns is a, a weekend morning meteorologist in Indianapolis. She was down in another station down here in Evansville. A lot of wonderful broadcast meteorologists come out of that. Um, but I'm just saying, uh, as far as broadcasting uh, goes, it's wonderful to find um, as much get as much experience, I should say, uh, in front of that camera as possible. Okay, great. And I'll come back to you, Cameron. I have a question sure. now for, for Adam, but I also have some questions coming in for Cameron too. So Adam, uh, I have a question from uh, Kayla who asks, what degrees do you hold to have this job? 
That's a, that's a very good question, I guess. And I do realize that I did not go over that. So my my degrees are in, uh, I have a bachelor's as well from Purdue University. So Derek and I uh, were, uh, were in school together. So a uh, bachelor's in atmospheric science, meteorology, kind of interchangeable there. And then I also do have a master's uh, from Mississippi State in applied meteorology. So purely meteorology education. And what I talked about as well uh, in some of my talks there, uh, a lot of the statistical side of uh, in kind of computer coding. Uh, I learned some of that in school, but a lot of that I learned kind of on the job and in my own time because uh, I, I really leveraged the internet quite a bit in terms of uh, free courses online, YouTube videos, blogs. Uh, the two languages I mentioned, both R and Python, are free. Uh, so the online community and support to learn those is is quite robust. So I, I highly recommend folks look into that and uh, and, and learn from there because there there are plenty of uh, plenty of opportunities. But uh, from my side, yeah, meteorology education is uh, is definitely sufficient because as I mentioned, it gives you such a well-rounded education uh, with with mathematics, science, critical thinking, and and other skills for you to uh, for you to leverage beyond just forecasting, uh, especially in the private sector. That's why so many of those jobs I posted, um, uh, the, the titles and opportunities are, are available uh, with this education. Thanks, Adam. I have a follow-up question from Kayla. She wants to know if you have any opinions about Mississippi State's online Master's of Geoscience uh, in Applied Meteorology. Are you familiar with that at all? Yes. That is uh, that that is the program that I actually uh, went to. So I was already working when I um, uh, when when uh, when I did that. So I was doing uh, work in school at the same time, and I completed that degree in 2013. Um, and I know it was it was relatively new at the time, but I I certainly found it uh, found it challenging and rewarding. Uh, so and I know they were they were kind of having a lot of feedback. Uh, at, as well at that time from uh, from the folks in the in in the program. So, um, but I found the coursework to be uh, to be quite challenging and, and and quite rewarding. So I learned quite a bit, including uh, some some foundations and uh, kind of even uh, additional statistical techniques, beginning of coding uh, when I worked on my research. Uh, so that really kind of springboarded me uh, to where I am today uh, with the, with the foundational knowledge. So. It uh, it definitely was a was a good program, and based on the uh, the staff that that taught me and the folks there, uh, they seemed uh, they were they were extremely competent and were looking to improve and adapt. Uh, so I can only imagine that the program is likely even better now. Okay, awesome. I hope hope that answers uh, your question, Kayla. Uh, Camera, I got a couple more questions from you, so I'll go ahead and uh, unmute you again. If it'll let me. Can you okay, hear me? There we go. Yes. Right. Um, I got a question from Johnny, who's asking: uh, Any broad? Are there any current broadcasting internships at your station or around the area? Um, you also mentioned that getting camera experience, and I was curious where that I, I can get that experience. And he says he's a student at OSU, so I'm not sure if that's a Oklahoma State or Ohio State, but <laughs> I know Ohio State has a very strong meteor meteorology program too. Okay, first things first, um, as far as, uh, I know that our station right now, we're not really doing um, internships currently, unfortunately, just because of everything we're currently going through. We're hoping that in the future we can kind of get that back up and running. Um, I, I don't know if other stations around uh, your area in particular, uh, that's where I would check first. Now, if you're in school and there's some sort of a program um, that has that, uh, either on air or nightly live newscast uh, sort of feel, even if it's um, a professor uh, that has a camera and a green wall somehow, that's how I, uh, that was another way I got started. Uh, my, uh, my meteorology professor, he had a, a, a cruddy little camcorder and he painted a wall in his office bright green and we were using, I think we were using PowerPoint to put together forecasts before we were okay to graduate to go on to our PBS station. Um, so it took a bit to get there, but um, as far as getting that on uh, camera um, experience, what I would do is first start at your school, try to research, find a program that um, allows that. If that's not the case, if your school does not have that, that's okay. Start getting into internships. 
um, try to find local internships. If it's Oklahoma State or Ohio State, um, find local stations um, uh, that have uh, open internships. Uh, try to apply for those. Get those. Um, that's how you're going to get that on air and on camera experience even before you graduate. Now, if you're not able to get that, that's okay. That's all right. Um, it's going to make things a little bit more difficult for you graduating if you don't have a resume reel, um, obviously. But you, if you can even just email a station, a local station, a lot of times, even if there's not an internship going, um, I'd find it hard for us to say that any meteorologist wouldn't be willing to meet with you and, and kind of show you the ropes and stuff like that, too. That's uh, We're all trying to help each other out in this business, uh, in, in this career path. Um, that would be another thing I would say that you could do if you weren't able to find a program at the school you're at or uh, apply for those internships um, outside of school. So that's, that's when I would try to create that list for you, um, trying to find that experience, get that on your non-camera experience before you even graduate. Yeah, I'll just add that um, I know the National Weather Association, they do they have their annual meeting. If, if it's in person, uh, it's sometime soon. Yeah. Uh, uh, they will do, is it a student tape swap or student tape critique? The, the tape swap, which is invaluable. <laughs> um, you know, and that's a perfect, that's something I didn't even mention during um, uh, my talk was, there are organizations, National Weather Association, uh, American Meteorological Associate, or, uh, Society, um, that really uh, hone and create communities within themselves of students, of professionals, and those are something to get uh, involved with. National Weather Association is the one I have my uh, seal of approval from, and like Derek said, when there is a yearly uh, annual uh, meeting, it's wonderful. Students come from all over the country. You bring a tape. Professionals in person will sit with you in a circle and individually go over each one of your resume reels or just the forecast uh, and give you wonderful advice. Um, and even uh, that's a possibility even outside of that uh, atmosphere. Email a, a local meteorologist and says, hey, hey, I'm a student. I'm trying to get better. Can you do me a favor, take five minutes and watch this and tell me what you think? Nine times out of 10, they're gonna email you back. Um, but yeah, Derek, that's perfect. National Weather Association conferences is, is a wonderful, wonderful tool. National Weather Association is a great um, organization to get involved with, become a member and attend that conference. Yeah, definitely. It's It's been a very rewarding uh, meeting and experience for me. Same way with the AMS as well. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question here for Ashley uh, from Kelly, who's asking, uh, I just applied for a Pathways internship and I was wondering what advice you might have to sell yourself since my GPA isn't as great, but I volunteered and been involved in involved at school. Um, okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so my experience um, as far as um, what hiring officials are looking for, they're looking more for people who are oriented with, you know, teamwork, things like that, who, um, you know, who they can bring into the office and they'll know that they'll mesh well together with a team. So, um, you know, really just having a passion for weather, having a passion for working in a team, serving your community um you know learning things uh leadership things like that and really serving you know the overall nws mission is going to count more than your grades in school um so that's what i would do is you know if you get an interview you know just be yourself um talk about you know what you're passionate and what your career goals are you know um you know your your passion for serving the community, um, you know, and for protecting lives and property. Um, that's what I would do. Um, you know, more times than not, that's what the hiring officials are going to be looking for. And whenever you do go through the interview process, that's what the questions that they ask are going to be geared toward. Um, it's, it's not going to be as, you know, uh, whether you can, 
<clears throat> derive certain equations and things like that. It's going to be more towards, um, you know, questions that it can, they can pick out your personality, how well you work with other people, um, and also situational questions, um, how you would handle uh, certain situations that can pop up in the workforce. Um, so hopefully uh, that makes you feel a little bit better. Um, you know, it's, it's my, my boss, when they hired me, said that we would, you know, we would much rather have somebody that can work well together with a team and be a good coworker um, than somebody that, you know, made straight A's in college. I'm not saying that that's not important because it is, um, you know, but grades aren't everything. Um, so hopefully that helps. Yeah, it definitely does. And uh, I'll just add that um, <clears throat> here, at, here at our office, I've heard you know, some, from some of the people who've hired other uh, interns uh, that, you know, the, the main thing is, you know, they want, they want you to show an interest. And, and the thing is, if you, if you make it to the part where the interview is, you, you, you've been, you've gone through this vetting process where they know you're qualified, you have the degree, uh, or you have the qualifications from an education standpoint, now that we get to that point, we're we're just trying to see how well you fit into our office. Do you fit, fill a need that we might have for you know a certain skill? Uh, do you get do you work well in, in a team? Do you work well you know or with with your coworkers? Are you passionate about the community? Uh, those are all um, really important um, things to consider when you get into the interviewing process. And I've interviewed for a few NWS jobs, and <clears throat> I think I've been asked a few dozen questions over those, those interviews. And I think I've only been asked one actual meteorology question, uh, only one time out of all those questions. It's always been about your the human factor, um, which is something they don't, they might not teach you as much in, in school, but it's definitely a huge part uh, with, uh, you know, with any team, with any office you might work in, not even just in meteorology in general. So uh, I have a couple questions here. Like I think I can kind of miss, push, uh, combine them because they, they're kind of related. Uh, this one question from Connor was for, for, for Cameron, but I think it could be open to anyone. Um, he's a junior in high school. He has a few colleges to pick out like Purdue, Oklahoma, Mississippi State. Are there any that you might recommend for meteorology? And then I have a question here from Michael who's asking about, um, are the curriculums the same uh, for different fields of meteorology, or does it just kind of depend on what you'd want to pursue? And I, I can open this up to anyone uh, if they have any comments. I think Cameron I might have to unmute you if you have anything. I can touch on that briefly. Okay, go ahead, Adam. Yeah, so that's um, <clears throat> I think it's a it's a very good question um, in terms of the and I think my my one slide kind of covered that I know I went through it quickly but you want to have the foundational uh, meteorology degree and I don't think there's too many different degrees I know like a school like Penn State does have weather risk management and they have some uh, you can almost call them spin-off courses but just supplemental courses that kind of talk about weather and energy weather and agriculture uh, they've had a very strong program for for many years now so they have the uh, they have the bandwidth to do that but uh, that exists uh, there, uh, but ultimately you're going to want to get your your fundamental meteorology degree, but then supplement with um, with electives. Um, and I, I highly stress statistics as as being one that uh, that really helps. I know that's kind of embedded in quite a few programs now these days, uh, so that that might be something that you already have in your uh, your predetermined coursework, which is great. Um, but yeah, in so much as learning other skills, especially for the private sector, uh, and the website that I shared kind of talks about that. It gives you an idea of supplemental courses needed for different industries, and many are actually similar. Uh, that that's kind of where I, I think the uh, the approach is. You know, you can always always supplement with with a, a course electives, and then also a minor if you so wish. Uh, I know many folks who have. Kind of gone into the private sector where they they have a you know bachelor's in meteorology but then a minor maybe in finance a minor in economics uh, and that type of uh, uh, that type of uh, education which helps them uh, kind of uh, excel in the private sector where they have some of that base base knowledge to to understand both business needs more immediately rather than learning through experience and of course have the weather foundation as well great thanks adam uh ashley or cameron do you have anything to add um, I can touch on this a little bit. So um, as far as people in our office, uh, I went to the University of Alabama in Huntsville. Um, it's not 
geared toward people that want to go into broadcast per se. Um, but anything with research or, um, you know, there's been a lot of people that have gone through and graduated within the, the past 10 years that have gotten in um, to both the weather service and the private sector. Um, so there at UAH, I had opportunities. I was involved in, um, in three uh, field projects. Um, there was one called the Pecan Project, the Plains Elevated Convection at Night Project, where I spent seven weeks out on the plains um basically uh using our our research vehicles we had a mobile radar and and tons of other um you know equipment and uh other radars that were you know mounted on on different research vehicles and we took them out there and um basically studied uh thunderstorms at night uh there were four different objectives in the project um and then as both an undergrad and a and a grad student um i got to do um, some work on the Vortex Southeast project, which if you guys aren't familiar with that, is basically um, studying the uh, the origins of tornado genesis in the Southeast. So, um, you know, you've got the, the traditional, you know, tornado alley out over the plains, but, um, you know, there's, a, there's the, what we call the Dixie Alley here in the South. Um, <clears throat> so, um, there were there were a ton of opportunities to get involved um, as far as the undergrad program goes. We have a, a sounding team there um, that we started up uh, when I was an undergrad. Um, so really with anywhere that you go, um, we've got people in our office that graduated from North Carolina State University and they loved it there. We've got, you know, some that graduated from Penn State, some that went to, you know, Florida State, um, you know, really all over. But the one piece of advice that I would give to you is, um, you know, basically any opportunity that you have to get involved, um, you know, to make connections and things like that, uh, take advantage of it. Um, you know, if you get if you get the opportunity to, per to participate in a field project, do it. If you get the opportunity to launch a few balloons, do it or to go to conferences, do it, um, because that's something that. Um, I think any hiring official, whether it be for the federal government or, you know, for the pro the private sector, um, for broadcast, they're wanting to know, you know, not only, you know, what classes you took, what grades you made, but, you know, what did you do with the opportunities that were provided for you at that university? You know, what, what did you do outside just, you know, the basic curriculum in school? Um, you know, were you a part of any clubs or, you know, any groups or did you do any research, things like that? So. The more and more you can get involved, the you know the more and more advantage you'll have uh, when it comes to competing against other people uh, for for securing a job. So that would be uh, the advice that I have. Thanks, Ashley. Um, go ahead, Cameron. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, and I'm going to just piggyback off of uh, what they both just said. Uh, yeah, getting that basic meteorology degree. Um, is going to allow you to step forth and help you step forth in whichever career you want. As far as broadcasting goes, getting the meteorology degree, yes, but a lot of, again, um, as far as broadcasting, uh, a lot of it is performance. It's a, being able to communicate. Knowing your science is one thing, but in, being able to communicate that science in a particular way, which folks at home uh, can best and most easily understand it, um, that's almost as important as knowing and having a good feeling for the science. So uh, if you are looking at as far as a broadcasting um, career path, um, it's knowing your science, but it's also being able to communicate it. Thanks, Cameron. And I'll just add that uh, for all the, the names and the colleges and, and, and whatnot, this is a, meteorology is a shockingly small field. <laughs> you tend to see the same names and, and you meet the same people uh, that you tend, that those names tend to come around a lot, um, and it, it, that's so. I think it's it's important to to get involved as much as you can in terms of networking because it it really has a a lot of uh, bang for your buck in terms of the effort you put into it as in compared to the return that you get. So I'll I'll just echo especially what Ashley said about trying to get involved in the field, whether you want to get uh, do research and present at conferences, if you want to be involved in a field project doing research. Uh, if you want to be do broadcast, you know, getting those internships, uh, anything you can do to get your name out there uh, is definitely a a great idea. 
um, I'll say that, you know, anything, you know, social media is such a big part. Uh, if you have interesting contributions you'd like to share on social media, anything interesting about weather or anything you might see that's interesting, or if you just have questions, I mean, there's nothing wrong about, you know, there's, uh, especially on Twitter, there's a very active meteorologist community that uh, is, you know, if you have questions, you know, you know, you might, you know, make a, make a new friend or make a, find a mentor that way. Um, it's, it's really, uh, it's really as much, you get as much out of it as, as what you put into it. So, well, I don't see any more questions and I think we're way over on time. So uh, I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Uh, if anyone else has any final words to share, uh, I, I'd be, I'd, you know, feel free to, feel free to have them. Otherwise we'll, uh, we'll call it a night. Derek, if you just really quick, um, I, if, and if anyone reach, wants to reach out, if there's any students out there listening, any prospective, uh, broadcasters out there listening, um, obviously not seeing me, <laughs> um, but, uh, feel free to reach out to me. My, uh, Twitter handle is, uh, cam Hopman WX. Uh, and then my email address is C Hopman at W E V V dot com. Um, any questions, if you, if you have a real you want me to look at, I'd be more than happy to do that. Uh, anything to help out um, prospective uh, broadcasters or meteorologists. Um, any way I can help. All right, thank you. And uh, just to just to wrap up, uh, if you have any questions for any of the other panelists or for me or any comments, uh, my email's there, Derek.Snyder at NOAA.gov. Um, I'll be uploading this. It'll probably be in two parts, but to our YouTube page for NWS Paducah youtube.com that slash nws paducah look for that coming online pretty soon and uh thank you for all for your great questions and uh for the nice comments i hope i we've made this worthwhile we might try to do something like this uh down the road if it's not too big of a deal if i can get over these technological issues so uh you all have a great uh great night thank you again for joining us and uh, be safe